right. I believe this means we are live. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, tech fans of all shapes and sorts and sizes and persuasions, welcome to another Monday morning tech chat on the SGGQA podcast channel. I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell, some gadget guy, the SGG of this perpetually terribly named podcast series. And the QA, of course, stands for question and answer. We like to make these interactive discussions every Monday morning. We've got a robust live chat. That's the only word for it. We're seeing some great faces, some great comments from folks already jumping into the live chat. Um, let me let me run down the list of folks I'm already seeing. Goran Petrovic, Muppinish, Matt Tyler, DTNL, MZVP, uh, MCVP18, my first SGGQA podcast live. You made it. Welcome to the party. LFA Reviews, Root Knight, Sulin, JMX Warrior, Vazikos 8, Two Spirits, Q3 Becker, Pata, Three-Legged Couch. Uh, we've got a kickin' live chat for some fun news stories. We're, uh, we've got a, a, a pretty uh, a pretty solid news block catching up on some stories that we've been tracking, uh, something that we were, we were uh, talking about last week that we're going to spend a little time talking about this week. Some problematic updates for Samsung and Apple. We've got uh, Apple and Google working together on the situation, which, again, everything that's going on in the world today, I, I still don't trust YouTube to not hit my channel with um, demonetizations when I speak talk about certain topics so childishly we're still going to be doing the big giant wink wink every time i say the situation um uh, hopefully google's analytics will start to fix that and we can try and talk about this stuff like grown-ups but unfortunately if i say it it just demonetizes stuff so let's not do that um and then we've got a, a really full gadget block talking one plus eight uh lg velvet um, a, a, a cute little story, uh, a cute little uh, topic on the uh, the Lumia project. There's a, a Windows on ARM Lumia project, so we're going to be looking at that too. And then we're going to wrap up the show like we've been trying to do for the last couple of weeks with some fun internet freebies. Uh, things to keep you entertained, things to keep you from going crazy bored. While a lot of us are working at home, uh, schooling at home, doing our social distancing, uh, we're probably burning through digital and online media a lot faster than we used to be. So uh, to, to start things off, um, uh, yesterday was was Easter. I, I, I hope, uh, my, my hope for everybody on these special days and on these holidays is that you were able to spend time uh, eating good food, that you were safe, that you were warm, well-fed, and that you were maybe able to catch up with some family and friends. Uh, we did a, a group chat with most of my family. Uh, we had eight windows going, and of course, because of internet connection issues or someone's Wi-Fi was terrible, it was a, it was a difficult conversation. <laughs> but it was lovely to see that you know my aunts, my uncles, my grandparents, you know, people were doing well. So I, I hope. Uh, you were able to to do something like uh, similar that you were able to spend some time with um with some uh people who care about you or people you care about i i i think it's always important uh, under the best of circumstances under the best of situations to to really grab hold of those opportunities um more so uh, more than ever really important uh, Lex got a wonderful visit from the Easter Bunny. Uh, she, uh, the Easter Bunny hid a bunch of really fun jelly bean filled eggs and uh, dropped off uh, a basket full of goodies. And uh, 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 mom and dad helped the Easter Bunny by picking up a, a copy of Candyland. So uh, this is Lex's second board game. I'm, I'm a little worried because Lex is a, uh, is a very expressive winner and she hasn't faced a bad beat in Candyland yet. In Candyland, when when you get rocked in Candyland, it, it can it can really mess with you. And so she hasn't faced that yet. We'll have to see how she handles, you know, uh, you know, being first getting to the end of Candyland and then drawing the peppermint card. So she has to go all the way back to the beginning. Could be rough. Could be rough. But we played three rounds of Candyland uh, yesterday, and she uh, she finished first twice and second once and even when she finished second as long as she beat someone else she was still happy <laughs> <laughs> so uh 
So we'll, we'll be on the lookout for some other games too. I'm trying to ease her into some more gaming, um, like Mario Kart, Kart Racer, stuff like that. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll see if we can also maybe uh, pick up the electronic uh, gaming side of, uh, of Lex's staying at home entertainment. But yeah, Easter was, Easter was fun. Easter was good. It was also uh, Arthur Lee. She's a natural born winner. <laughs> I think most kids are. I think most kids are natural born winners. Um, she is really good at trash talking when she's in the lead. Well, looks like I'm far ahead of mommy still. And she's got like attitude on it. Like there's a little venom on it. Um, but but again, we'll have to see how she handles it when uh, when she takes a bad beat. <laughs> Matt Tyler until they lose. Yeah, um, it, I'm, I, I'm pretty confident there will be some frustration board throwing or tears. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> but yeah, it was also uh, my wife and I's anniversary that weekend. So we, we cooked up the last of our tamales. We've got a, we had a stock of new Mexican tamales from El Modelo. They were delicious. And uh, yeah, yeah, the weekend was good. Um, it, this was probably, since everything's been going down, this is probably one of the better weekends we've had just for trying to take some time off, trying to just trying to figure out what our new normal is, uh, is looking like from Sam 34. It ain't trash talking if you can back it up. <laughs> my, my daughter pulling two first, first, uh, first place finishes, uh, out of three games. I, I think she feels like she is now indomitable in Candyland. Oh, and Dave Burns, LFA, Michael SSBU, thank you so much. My wife and I have been together for a while. We've been inseparable since uh, 2001, so uh, we, we've been together for a bit. But again, it was it was a, the right weekend. It was a good weekend for us to, to sit down and have a state of the marriage. I mean, not like a scary conversation, just like a, man, we're in this. This, this is a thing, and we're a thing, and we've got a daughter, and she's amazing, and um, yeah, it, it, it was a nice, it was a nice refueling weekend. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Simon says, uh, Simon says hypno and Arthur Lee Candyland is the gateway game. So the first game we started Lex off was a game called Hoot Owl Hoot, which is a co-op board game. So, uh, she, she, uh, she, she took to that, but the, the visceral thrill of beating people doesn't manifest in a co-op game, right? You get to the end, and if you beat the game, everyone at the table feels good. The we, we I was actually a little surprised to see how much Lex lit up at taking down opponents. So now, now that's 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 where we're gonna watch. <laughs> now I'm curious to see where that goes from there. Sam thirty four battleship. Oh man. I have some brutal memories of playing Battleship against my mom. Um, she 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 was uh, she was unforgiving, and I, I always tried to like cheat, you know, like I'd move a ship around, uh, try and like get away, and she'd still like just crush me. So, folks, like I said, we've got a very very full show. Um, I, uh, housekeeping is a little lighter, just because of everything that's been going on. My production schedule's been a little out of whack. So I, I really had, last week we, I said I really had designs on getting the LG V60 review out. And I did. It took me, it, it took a lot more effort to finish off as deep a dive review as I wanted to put out there. I mean, this was really the, the kind of conversation I wanted to have about the phone. It's a 26 minute review. Um, but uh, my normal testing protocols are way off. So trying to recreate my Wi-Fi test from scratch in a new place, um, that took a lot longer than I was expecting it to. Uh, same thing, like I'm gonna try and finish up a camera review, review not for this week, but just use this week to finish shooting it. Then next week, try and get some kind of V60 camera deep dive out there. And I don't have, it, it, it's, it's been surprising to me, it shouldn't have been surprising to me, but it has been surprising to me that I have been in such a pattern on finishing those types of reviews that I know immediately what I'm looking for when I'm shooting some of the landmarks that I've been shooting since 2012. Uh, this will be the first camera review where I'm not war driving around Southern California to the field with trees, uh, Balboa Park, Lake Balboa, 
the creepy tunnel, the creepy gate. Um, I, I'm trying to shoot similar looking, uh, similar looking spots out here because we just moved to a new place. But um, it makes the analysis part of this a lot more time consuming. And the same thing happened with the full review, you know, trying to track my LTE performance, trying to find 5G. I'm in a completely new neighborhood and the cell reception out here is garbage. So it, 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 was, a, it was a really interesting review to put together. It was a lot more challenging to finish that review off the way I wanted to finish it. And so uh, I, I think that's just going to be a part of the new normal for the next couple phones until I, I figure out a new pattern which kind of helps me talk about these things in a way that I feel is consistent to the way I was talking about them before. So, um, so yeah, it, it's, um, <laughs> oh, Q3 Becker pressing F for the old creepy tunnel. As soon as this, uh, this is all down, I'm taking the, no matter where we are in phone reviews, it could be like 2022 and they say, oh yeah, quarantine's finally lifted. Um, I am, I'm going to take all the phones that missed the creepy tunnel and I'm going to do a roundup on this is what the creepy tunnel looks like <laughs> with all of these old phones. So, uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, I'll make sure to catch back up when I can. It'll, it'll be hilarious if, if, if this goes on through the summer, like I'm going to have a backpack of phones because I, I, I just can't imagine future, as long as I'm living near Los Angeles. I cannot imagine camera reviews without the creepy tunnel. Uh, from Newt Night 5. So between audio, photo, and Wi-Fi, you had every part of the test changed in some way in a short time. A and yes, thank you for bringing that up. The V60 audio review. I do have an audio deep dive on the Patreon. And that's uh, the first review off of my new recording hardware because my older hardware, hardware recording, um, my old audio recording hardware died. So yeah, even that was like a completely new testing protocol. So it was, it, it's, it's been, it's been, um, it's been a month. This, this, uh, this last month has been kind of the longest year of my life. So, um, <laughs> but, uh, I, I await the creepy tunnel roundup because what I think I, I really want to do is just do a very simple, it'll be like an editorial just to say like, look at how far we've come here. Here's what video looked like of this landmark back in 2012. We were all so impressed with video on our phones eight years ago. <laughs> so, um, so I, I, I want to do kind of like a greatest hits, you know, this is what it looked like eight years ago, a couple years back. This is when I started, I thought stuff started looking a lot better. Here's when we really started pushing 4K on phones. This is what it looks like today on larger sensors. It, I, I, I have designs. I have designs on a, a retrospective of the creepy tunnel. So um, let's get some housekeeping out of the way. I know I've been running really, really long on housekeeping. I'm already 15 minutes into the podcast now. But because of everything that kind of went down in finishing the V60, I didn't get as much out as I wanted, but I have four videos shot ahead that I think we'll be able to kind of pepper out over this next week, kind of catch back up. And one of them I'm really excited about is, um, is another editorial for hashtag 2020 hearing, which is, again, with all of the life changes we've been going through, my hearing project has kind of been not pushed aside, but it's been more difficult to get those videos out to supplement the channel. Um, again, everything's just been a bit more of a challenge. That's one I don't want to let slip slip by. So, so uh, be on the lookout for a 2020 hearing video out very soon, as soon as I can finish it. So three major um, videos that came out over this last week. The first one is just a return to form, a, con a style of conversation I have been missing for way too long. And I've been given a bunch of my friends a ton of crap about trying to bring back our old school podcast where I sat down with my buddy Warren. Oh, whoops, that is not what I meant to screen share. I sat down with my buddy Warren, bw1.com, and he and I talked about uh, iPhones, USB C, and Android's desktop mode. This is a. Uh, this was a long time coming. Uh, for, for those of you who remember years back, I mean, I can't even remember how long ago it was. It was like three or four years ago that we stopped doing 
the Board at Work weekly tech podcast. Every Saturday morning, like four or five of us would would get up. For me, it was early on a Saturday morning, and we talked for like two hours about whatever was uh, whatever tech was happening in the news. And again, it, just like this podcast has become for me, a great way to ref refuel. You know, it's it's a great way to check in with people who are like minded, who share uh, the same kind of passion for these types of conversations. Uh, the Board at Work Weekly was that very much. This was like our water cooler chat. You know, you have work friends. Well, when you're a tech reviewer, you don't really have an office, right? It's like, I get to see these folks at trade shows, or then we have to make the effort to do these types of like video calls and stuff. And the podcast was a great way to kind of not only bring us together, but bring all of our viewers together too, because we're all buddies, we're all pals. So Warren and I chatted for about an hour. Uh, talking about just uh, where we think the future of Android sh should go, the popularity of different tablet solutions, why Android hasn't been competitive in this space. And uh, it, I, it was just, again, it was another one of those replenishing conversations. So you can catch that out on the BW1 YouTube channel. I'll have every every story that we talk about is going to be linked for the show notes on this, on this episode. Uh, you can catch the show notes on somegadgetguy.com for all of the stories. I will, of course, be linking uh, Warren's YouTube channel so you can catch our uh, our long form conversation. And from Def Burns too, no one has an office anymore. <laughs> I, I I cannot express, you know, especially when this is looking more and more like a marathon and less and less like a you know a short jog, that uh, the psychology of working from home can be pretty intense. You do not realize how much office life interrupts your day, how many extra steps you take walking around the office or taking a lunch break. Um, th there's There are some great perks. I, I feel like depending on your work-life balance, you can you can focus on work better. You can be more productive. But then uh, you, know, you miss out on some of those work friendships, conversations, daily interruptions that help you, you know, kind of shake up your day. This stuff is rough. I mean, this is not easy. And from someone who's been working primarily at home for the, for the last several years, uh, it took me a long time to kind of figure out what my work-life balance should look like, and I feel like I still often get it wrong. Uh, moving right along, some, uh, some other housekeeping here. Um, speaking of making a work-life transition, I feel a lot of folks out there are scrambling to try and put together sort of return to the types of computing space that we all used to have when I was a kid. Uh, if you're a, a slightly older tech geek like me, you probably remember having the com the family computer space, you know, and, and how much work uh, a parent would put into having a desk so that you could have your giant ugly beige tower and the CRT monitor and a keyboard and a mouse. My mom would sometimes, you know, play around with those weird ergonomic chairs because uh, she, she was a, a computer programmer. In, in an age of smartphones and tablets and ultra thin laptops, I feel like a lot of families stopped putting the computer desk effort into coming up with a workspace. Because yeah, I'm gonna do a little work from home. Occasionally I pop open the laptop, I can work in bed or work on the couch, punch out a couple emails, totally fine. And now a lot of folks are really trying to catch back up because you might be doing your office job at home. Working on the couch is not really conducive for that. And depending on your situation, you probably need a, a backup monitor or a second display, or maybe you have this cute little laptop, but you need extra workspace off on the side. So this review came in really timely for us. I mean, I've got the gadget lab and Marie and I can kind of co-work sometimes if we need just a quiet space or I can go out, work with Lex, she can kind of come in here. But she also needs a flexible setup for when she's out on the dining room table trying to get her work done also. And so uh, Le Pau, which is just a cool name because it's kind of like French Batman, right? You know, like Le Biff, Le Splat, Le Pau. I made that joke in the review. Um, <laughs> Le Pau 15.6 inch portable monitor review. This is an inexpensive, super portable bus powered USB-C monitor. You can also connect it over HDMI. It is designed to sit right next to uh, a, a medium sized laptop. 
It, it's got a little folding stand, kind of like an iPad flip cover. I didn't love that, but it's really easy to set up on some type of tablet stand or flexible stand. You can kind of just prop it up, plug it in with one cable, start working. When you're done with your workday, you unplug one cable, fold it all up, tuck it away, and you're good to go. So uh, that, that really came in handy for us. As much as I love finding those types of accessories anyway, um, this one was, that review was really timely. As, as we're talking and doing this podcast right now, Marie has her Surface laptop hooked up to a second monitor and she's going to town on her work right now in, in the dining room. So uh, it's, it's, I mean, genuinely, you, you all often question, you know, like when reviewers like me get review kit, do we really use it? Do we just kind of play with it? You know, is, is it just something that's kind of fun for us and it goes into a closet or we try and sell it on eBay? This one really came in handy and, and it's getting a lot of mileage in our household right now. And get this out of the way. And of course, the biggie, I've already brought it up. Um, it's a really, I'm really proud of how this review came out especially considering all of the, the changes to my workflow. Uh, LG V60 review, it's big. Um, the V60 is shaping up to be, for me, one of the most interesting phones to talk about um, for uh, 2020. So many manufacturers are going to be in an odd spot this year. Uh, component shipping is going to be increasingly expensive. Qualcomm jacked up prices on chipsets and modems where they used to be just all on one chip. Now Qualcomm is making a money play for all of these new 5G devices that are coming out. At the same time, that market uncertainty and, and job uncertainty is hitting a lot of consumers. And I, I, I'm actually very excited by the number of conversations I'm having in YouTube comments and on social media where folks are really looking at how they can get more use out of a gadget, hold on to a phone for longer. I mean, maybe they've got a phone that's two years old and they're gonna try and push that third year out of it where before they might have tried to, to flip a phone a little earlier. And so every company is facing this challenge in different ways. A lot of companies are looking at just bumping up prices. We're not gonna compromise on some of these fancy screen technologies, so you've got a thousand dollar phone. LG was already trying to balance costs and profits. The V60 is a phone that's already been, what, 18 months in development? That's about the timetable. You know, whatever we have today, companies were working on two years before. So LG was already trying to make a pivot towards a less expensive, but still premium handset. And that conversation is now starting to take root in light of all these other $1,000, $1,200, $1,400 normal phones. You know, a $1,400 phone used to mean some kind of fancy extreme build material or folding technology or something like that. Now, the top end for a regular slab of glass phone is around $1,400. That's not what LG is doing here. So it, it's, a, it's a pretty nuanced conversation. And unfortunately, it's one that I don't feel will get as much attention as it really deserves because it's LG. I think if Samsung had said, well, we're going to do this and we're really working with our customers and we want to focus on these types of features and this type of functionality, people would understand it really, really easily and you'd have an army of Samsung Knights out there telling everyone that that was the right choice. Uh, given the comments that I've been scrubbing out of my YouTube uh, review, this messaging is a lot more difficult to express when it comes from a company that's not good at marketing, like LG. <laughs> Three-legged couch. Uh, uh, at some booty guy. <laughs> Matt Tyler, some perky butt guy. Yeah, I'm just glad I'm not getting too many thick jokes. I am I am trying so hard not to leave this stay-at-home order significantly rounder than when I went, went into it. So I was really proud of that angle on the booty shot. <laughs> so <laughs> LFA reviews, extra thick. <laughs> Meme Wranglot, the thick is for the phone, not your booty. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> it's so big. The phone is so large. <laughs> so if, if you need 26 minutes of commentary, as opposed to just saying, oh, it's got a 1080p screen, and that means it's the worst and bad, um, I'm happy to talk about everything else <laughs> regarding the, uh, the LG V60. Uh, but for me, the biggest concern isn't the display. Uh, for what this phone is trying to do, the LG V60 has a higher resolution over both displays at a tighter pixel pitch over a larger surface area than the Galaxy Fold. Considering what the Fold is trying to do with multi-app modes and multitasking and what the V60 actually succeeds at for multitasking, I feel like that's totally fine. Is it a compromise? Yes. Is it a deal breaker? No. And if you go into a V60 understanding what the phone can and can't do and what it's good at, then I think you are better informed for a purchasing decision rather than just 1080p is not as good. Um, if that's your only contribution to a tech discussion, I'm scrubbing your comment. I, I mean, I feel like I am not missing out on any valuable tech commentary on my YouTube channel. So, um, now there are a bunch of people that still disagree with my positive assessment of the phone, but they're actually replying to things I mention in the video. That's interesting for me. That I actually value. Please tell me where you think I might be missing the boat or where I might be kind of unfairly assessing some of these gadgets. But if your only, your only opinion is informed by some other YouTuber who didn't review the phone, um, but had it on day one, and had a review ready in 36 hours. I'm not impressed. So uh, yeah, that's that's housekeeping, and I still managed to go a little long. <laughs> <sighs> so uh, Dave Burns, even normal reviewers think that these luxury devices are going overboard. But but I'd love to see that. I'd love to see people changing the tone of their discussion. Um, I mean, again, spoiling my V60 review, a major part of the review is telling people if you're doing basic things on a phone, do not buy this phone. Um, and, and I wish that that was a, as clearly expressed on a Galaxy S20 review. Most of the people I know would not only do well with, but would be incredibly happy with the experience on a Galaxy A series but they've been programmed that they need to have the good phone. So they're gonna spend all that extra money on a Galaxy S series, even though they're not really doing anything that's gonna tax a Galaxy S. Same thing, Pixel 3a. Um, the number of people in my family. So now all of my siblings are rocking a Pixel 3a. My brother um, had a smashed old beater on her phone um, where he smashed the screen a while ago, but now it's starting to cut through the tape that he had protecting his thumbs. So he finally bit the bullet. He talked to my sister. My sister and her husband are already on Pixel 3As. And they were like, yeah, just get a Pixel 3A. It's going to be like way better than what you currently have. And he got it on sale. It was like two, 290, two, uh, something like that. And he also picked up Google Fi service. So he got a free month of Google Fi on top of that. That phone is incredible upgrade for what he was using before. So th this 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 whole this whole conversation like oh yeah oh man I'm really concerned about higher phone prices but here's the Galaxy S20 Ultra and we're only going to use it how average consumers might use it. So it has all these cool things that you can do in the camera app, but I'm only going to shoot full auto. I'm only going to push the shutter button because average consumers never go through menus. But $1400 phone. That's that's the phone you should buy. I, I'm 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 not feeling this concern over higher phone prices when the tone of the conversation is still pointing towards the most expensive phones as the default consumer options. If someone comes to me and says, hey, I need a laptop to do some writing and I want to watch some video on it and it needs to have decent battery life, I'm not going to tell them to go and pick up, you know, a, a five thousand dollar gaming rig. And that's what we're doing in phones. And that to me feels disingenuous. The conversation feels disingenuous because those really expensive phones do way better for YouTube analytics. 
So again, I feel like the algorithm has manipulated this content in a way where we're not really getting this, the, the kind of thoughtful content we should be. If we're concerned about average consumers, we need to be spending way more time on Xperia 10s, Moto Gs, Pixel A series, Galaxy A series, uh, you know, this new iPhone SE that I'm very excited about. I think this is gonna be an amazing option if, if Apple can get this out the door with all of the distribution issues. That's that's our conversation, not $1,400 Galaxy Ultras just because it's a shocking and outrageous price. <laughs> From Root 5 Oh, but let's trash the Pixel for offering a dumbed down experience, but they don't review the Galaxies any more in depth. <laughs> So um, let's get into some news. We've got a couple a uh, couple quick news topics. I actually want to try and blow through news very very quickly here. Uh, first of all, um, well, just news has been kind of heavy lately, right? I think we can all agree on that. I I'm trying to focus on some of the fun topics a little bit more and not quite so much the outrage porn um, because I feel like there's enough of that going around and so much media just seems crafted on. Can we can we scare you and outrage you so that you'll share something on Facebook? So that's lame. Um, I have to I have to cover this uh, this story from last week though. Uh, we talked about the conspiracy theories that are that are going up across the web, people that are trying to link um, telecommunications equipment with the situation and infectious disease, and unfortunately. I mean, it seemed pretty clear to me, but unfortunately, it, it is playing out the way I hoped it wouldn't, is once one of these terrible, misinformed conspiracy theories starts to kind of latch onto a population, it spreads like a virus. Um, from anti-vaxxers to flat earthers, once an idea like that takes root, it is nearly impossible to completely scrub that back out and, and expose people to better information, help them with their critical thinking skills. It, it, it's, it's unfortunate, but the individual who really goes deep on that kind of content start very quickly becomes kind of a lost cause. It's an emotional, irrational attachment to an idea. And one of the things that we talked about last week was how do we correct for that? How should we correct for that? Because the situation is getting worse. Uh, and by that, I mean more uh, five, uh, 5G cell phone towers are getting damaged and set on fire. Now, uh, Dutch towers. This is a story um, direct from Reuters. And again, I always have to look. Reuters doesn't share a byline, so I don't know who wrote up this story for Reuters. So I, I'm, I'm going to try and do a better job of dropping links in the live chat as we go. Out of Amsterdam, several Dutch cell, cellular broadcasting towers have been damaged by arson or sabotage in the past week by opponents of a rollout of a new 5G telecommunications network, newspaper De Telegraaf reported on Saturday. The paper said that there had been four such incidents in the past week and cited the director of an industry group that oversees placement of cell towers in the country, the Monet Foundation. Uh, Telegraph reported that arsonists had left anti-5G slogan spray-painted at the scene of one attack. A range of groups in the Netherlands have been opposed to the advent of 5G for some time, mostly over concerns that radio waves could damage human health. Others fear the technology could infringe on privacy. So, um... I'm just trying to, uh... <laughs> Simon says Hypno. 3G gave me cooties. Um... In modern society, in how we bombard communities and the human organism with radio signals, I feel there are some long-term health outcomes that we should be studying. At present, I have seen little evidence to suggest that this is an emerging health crisis and that this is further being fueled by a spread of terrible information, misinformation, and linking 
uh, some of these technologies with um, with what's going on, why we're quarantining and social distancing, the situation. So it's um it's unfortunate. I feel like some of this some of this misinformation spread is being done and is being amplified by bad actors um, in, in a way to me that feels very much like the way that elections are being manipulated with misinformation on social media. I can't see what the benefit would be of telecommunications companies putting out a technology that would nearly immediately dose everybody and cause radiation sickness. So there's no benefit there, right? I, I, I can't see what the profit is. You know, step one, set up cell towers. Step two, uh, make people sick with radiation poisoning. Step three, question marks. Step four, profit. That, 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 that doesn't make any sense. But what does make sense is a coordinated, bot-fueled misinformation campaign that leads to destabilization of telecommunications uh, infrastructure. You get people so hyped up on bad information that they're willing to do things like torch cell phone towers, and that's going to wreck communities' ability to engage online and have access to good information. That, to me, now becomes the larger concern here, is that a gullible chunk of the population who is vulnerable and susceptible to the spreading of bad information can be motivated to act to destroy their own ability to participate in global communication. And that's freaky to me. That, that really is scary. That, to me, is now like psychological cyber warfare. And we need to find a better way of getting around and getting ahead of these types of situations. Um, I, I, I don't hold any ill will towards flat earthers. They're, they're harmless. <laughs> they're, they're wrong, but they're harmless. Um, 5G conspiracy theorists are now, are now trying to actively destabilize our telecommunications infrastructure at the time we need good data the most. So, um, so it's unfortunate. Um, th these are the kinds of conversations I hope we can continue to have and continue to spread. And for our own family and friends, if someone is starting to go down that rabbit hole, it's up to us. It's up to us to pump the brakes, help them not become that individual who can be you know, partially radicalized by terrible, terrible information. It's rough. Uh, so, uh, moving right along. Let me get this out of the way here. Oh, what? Did I just lose one of my stories? I did. Hold on one second. I got to see if I can get this back. All right, and there's a garbage truck right out my outside my window. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna push pause on this for just a second. Um, it's so loud uh, because the other story uh, that's kind of about terrible and awful people. Okay, here we go. I've got it back. Um, Simon says, Hypno, flat earthers contribute to the anti-science movement and the, accept and the acceptance of expert informed data. So I completely agree that flat earthers help generate a climate of not trusting good data. But what I mean are, are flat earthers are not out there torching museums that feature globes. So as, as, as much as they can influence other people and help spread bad information. So they're not completely harmless. I mean, they are not taking direct action to harm people. <laughs> 5G conspiracies, conspiracy theorists are starting to take direct action, which immediately causes harm to other people. Um, this other story is just awful. And uh, I hope that there is a solution. This is coming out of The Verge. Uh, let me get this out of the way here. People are baiting Instacart workers with huge tips, then slashing them to zero. Instacart allows users to adjust tips up to three days after 
delivery. And uh, again, in a gig economy where people are now exposing themselves to actual risk to do things like uh, do your grocery shopping, this is this is awful. Um, who wrote this story up? Uh, Nat Gar Garon. Uh, Instacart workers are being wooed by orders with large tips only to find them dropped to zero after a delivery has been made. Instacart lets users set their own custom tip with each shopping request, but it also allows them to change it up for up to three days after an order is completed to adjust for experience. Workers, however, claim that some users have been abusing this feature, baiting them with big tips to get their shopping requests completed sooner amid the situation, only to find the tip slashed afterwards without much feedback. So, um, hold on. And the end of the article, Instacart says shoppers who experience tip baiting can report instances in app, though some workers say this relies too much on their end and that the company should make a 10% minimum tip mandatory for all orders during the situation. So I don't think that a mandatory tip should be, um, I don't think a, a tip should be mandatory. One, I kind of feel like Instacart should be looking at raising rates. It, there, there is a huge competitive issue at play. And, and I'm really looking at this like a capitalist. Um, it's kind of like surge pricing for Uber. People who are doing Instacart work are putting their health in jeopardy. And Instacart doesn't supply, you know, like health insurance. <laughs> <laughs> especially here in the United States in other countries where you have some type of single payer or uh, Medicare for all style health, uh, uh, health care system, some type of NHS. Um, I can understand having a little bit more leeway. Instacart is a terrible idea in a country with, with privatized medicine as you now have an individual who likely will not have health insurance or you know, at least access to affordable health insurance in the same way that a person on an, on an NHS might, driving around, if they get sick, they're relying on those gigs to pay their bills. So they're probably going to try and work sick, further spreading disease. And uh, you're, you're not going to have a system where people are able to take some time off uh, if they do, if they do pick up a bug. Um, Oh, uh, from Aditya Anil, could could you explain to me what Instacart is? Basically, Instacart is like Uber, only for groceries. So I put in an order at my grocery store for milk, eggs, bread, turkey, and a frozen pizza. And then that goes to Instacart, and Instacart sends that to a driver, and that person goes to the grocery store and picks up all the things off the shelves and drives it to my house and then drops it off for me. Um... The uh, the situation here is gaming this so that you can try and entice an Instacart shopper, the person who's going to do the delivery, with a big fat tip. So what I think kind of needs to happen is, um, one, Instacart drivers, they should be paid a lot more. Two, tips should be invisible before the completion of the drive. Make, make this a meritocracy, you know? Uh, you get in line, the Instacart driver is being compensated better for their time. They're less concerned about trying to pick only the big tips. And then if you genuinely want to express, um, you know, a, a extra appreciation for an Instacart driver doing a good job, you tip them on the back end. But that wasn't the motivating factor of whether or not someone picked up that gig. And so that those two together, I think would completely solve this issue. But anyone right now who's doing like a two day or three day, you know, big tip to zero tip, that needs to be on Instacart to start weeding out people that are, are pre-tipping in total bad faith. That needs to be a, you're gonna lose your Instacart account kind of um, uh, transgression in this current day and age. Um, from LFA Reviews, I can't even place an order via the app. Too many users here. I am forced to risk everything once per week to buy fresh groceries for my wife's special dietary needs. We used to use both Whole Foods and Amazon Fresh Delivery Service prior to the situation. 
Um, from Sam, 34. I grab orders by closeness of the drive and orders that aren't super huge. And again, I mean, like, seriously, if, if, if I were out there trying to, to do some gig work like that, minimum contact, minimum exposure. I don't care about the tip, especially right now where someone can yank the tip after I'm done. Um, from LFA Reviews, Instacart needs to cancel those people's accounts. Yeah, they absolutely do. Um, and Route Night 5. See, this is what I don't understand. A tip is a reward for a great job, so pre-tipping doesn't make much sense. But Instacart has made this somewhat something of an auction system. So uh, I'll throw $20 on top. Oh, well, I need a driver even faster, so I'll, fo I'll throw $40 on top. And, and again... These types of services have always played games with how tips are paid out to the drivers. I think Instacart was even caught in a minor scandal of tips going to pay part of the fee for the Instacart driver as opposed to being extra money on top. So all of these gig economy style jobs and services have been suspect from the beginning, but Instacart is trying to ratchet up this, this engagement and, and putting it on the the customers to make themselves seem more desirable to do the shopping for. It was DoorDash, thank you. Maybe it wasn't Instacart, but Dave Burns too. DoorDash would use in-app tips uh, to subsidize their bottom line and not the driver. So always tip to dr delivery drivers in cash. And again, that that's a, the right solution, but as a delivery driver, I'm not sure I'd want to take money out of someone's hand right now. <laughs> like, thanks. I know you're trying to be nice and give me extra money, but maybe not. I don't know. Because if you're using something like like Instacart, maybe you're sick and you don't want to leave the house. Uh, I'm scared. So, uh... <sighs> Mimranglot, you of course know what the hum in the background is. Someone tell Mimranglot what the hum in the background of my audio is. Right outside my window. It's gonna rain again today. There is no point. The, the our, our, our new place's HOA is ridiculous for, for this type of landscaping. It's like they're, they're, they're not hiring landscapers for when we actually need work done. They're hiring landscapers. Uh, they're hiring landscapers at the same day, at the same time, regardless. I understand how contracts like that are supposed to go down. And it's not like I don't want to see these. The, it's not like I want to see landscapers out of work. But even before the situation... It's like you go outside, everything would be pristine. And there are people walking around with leaf blowers, not blowing anything because they were here last week and we don't have a ton of trees that drop leaves. So uh, moving right along. Uh, this is just a quick little bite of a story. Um, I, I, I'm a big proponent of tech competition but in certain instances, tech cooperation is, is also something we should be seeking and is something that's really important to how new services uh, kind of make it to populations. So this was a, a joint press release. Uh, I've got the Google press release up here. But Apple and Google partner on the situation tracing technology. Uh, published April 10th. Across the world, governments and health authorities are working together to find solutions to the situation to protect people and get society back up and running. Software developers are contributing by crafting technical tools to help combat the situation and save lives. In the spirit of collaboration, Google and Apple are announcing a joint effort to enable the use of Bluetooth technology to help governments and health agencies reduce the spread of the situation with user privacy and security central to the design. Uh, in the coming months, Apple and Google will work to enable a broader Bluetooth-based contact tracing platform by building this functionality into the underlying platforms. 
This is a more robust solution than an API and would allow more individuals to participate if they choose to opt in, as well as enable interaction with a broader ecosystem of apps and government health authorities. Privacy, transparency, and consent are of utmost importance in this effort, and we look forward to building this functionality in consultation with interested stakeholders. We will openly publish information about our work for others to analyze. So um, let me get this out of the way here. So looking at some way that as you move around, you can kind of keep a loose record of who you bounce off of. I'm not entirely sure how privacy can be maintained in a system like that. So I'm very curious to see what the follow-ups might be. But again, given the information that we have, the lack of testing in a number of markets across the world, especially here in the United States, across the country, and kind of untangling. Oh, someone someone has, has fallen prey to the situation. Who did they come in contact with? Having some of this data could be really beneficial. The way that something like this is implemented um, is the biggest concern. How do we enable this type of functionality? Um, you know, I... It, similar questions being brought up when you look at find my phone style uh, security systems, you know, like uh, whether or not um, you can track where a phone might have gone or if it was stolen or what Wi-Fi it was last connected to or it was last uh, seen uh, trying to connect to. My big concern is Bluetooth. Trying to enable something like this on a broad scale cross-platform compatibility and using a protocol that still, I don't believe has lived up to the security concerns of modern life in the 21st century is really my big concern. Whether or not Apple or Google can come together and make a, a good platform for that service, I'm not too concerned. But using a wireless standard that continues to have issues with uh, properly securing devices and uh, preventing um, attacks is, is the one is the one sticky spot for me. <laughs> uh, JMX Warrior, if Google and Apple can do that, I wish files could be sent through Bluetooth between the two home assets. <laughs> uh, now, to be fair, I don't feel that sending and receiving files over Bluetooth is an Android issue. Uh, I, I feel like in my years of using, uh, from all the way back from Windows Mobile PDAs to the present day, one company seems to have bigger problems supporting any type of open file transmission standard, uh, not properly supporting media transfer protocols, not properly supporting USB IO, and not properly supporting Bluetooth file sharing. And I don't think it's Android. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh. And JMX Warrior, absolutely, it, it really needs to be standardized on Android with all manufacturers. We're probably going to be seeing some type of AirDrop competitor. Um, but but again, it's uh, can, can we can we can we expect the goodwill of general consumers and the tech society out there to enable some type of situation tracking. We have these amazing pocket computers. We could be using, we already have all these fitness trackers, location data sharing. The ugly side of that is when companies take this information without properly disclosing to us how the information is going to be used. And then build a profit model, you know, a, a way to profit off of that information by making us the product or even just the fuel of a product. But can there be a flip side to that? Can there be a good side to that? And can we get consumers on board when I think faith in this industry is at an all-time low? And that to me becomes the interesting question. There, there are some social goods that could come out of this can those social goods be balanced against our concerns over privacy, our concerns over profiteering, 
and uh, who, who might have access to that information in the long run. And that to me becomes the inter interesting question. So this is something I'm really gonna try and pay attention to. And I feel it's gonna be a, a long-term conversation because whatever happens to society during this situation will have ramifications for generations. Um, we, we need to look at what tech policy we're enabling today because it's, it's gonna have a ripple effect 20 years from now that we won't be able to predict. Oh, and Fat Produce is in the live chat. Everyone say, hey, Andrew. Hey, Andrew. Uh, let me get this out of the way here. So two quick stories. Um, I'm not gonna dwell on these for too long. Some minor concerns out there for Samsung and Apple users. Uh, this is the wrong time to be putting out updates or software that might mess up uh, a computer. So I'm dropping two links in the live chat right now. Uh, the first, this one kind of hurts my heart a little bit because it's affecting one of the last true Samsungs that I really liked. <laughs> um, I'm saying that uh, purposely in that way because of some of my issues with Samsung White Knights. Uh, Samsung Note 9 display brightness issue. Now this is on the Samsung community. Apparently, a number of people in the Samsung forums are, are facing some weird screen problems that they all started manifesting after the March update. So if you have a Note 9, and some people are saying it's happening on their Galaxy S9s, that the screen color, screen brightness, and responsiveness are are impacted after this update. That apparently they did something to change the display settings. And there are some issue, the some photos here of people who have had otherwise perfectly functional normal Galaxy Note 9s now with more significant burn-in uh, and banding issues. So if you have one uh, consistent gradient or consistent color on your screen, you can see these bands affecting the screen, and then, then the screen starts to burn bad, and you see these lines sort of baked into the display after a period of time. There are a lot of people, <laughs> there are a lot of community links. Hold on, just in this one, they, they link to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine other um, community links uh, detailing the same types of issues following the March update. And a few folks are then linking out to say, hey, on my Galaxy S9, I'm seeing something similar like that too. So anytime we see problems with an update like that, it's not it, it's not that I'm trying to spread the word because, oh, Samsung's screwing up again. Blah, 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 blah. This is the beginnings of when you track an issue to see if it becomes a wider spread problem. If you are on a Galaxy Note 9 and you have updated to the March patch, watch your display settings. See if the phone is doing anything funky for a couple days. And then if it seems like it's doing fine, go, go about your business. But we have enough of a starting point of a conversation here where I would at least recommend the observation window to at least pay attention lest something happen with your display and it start to really start cooking itself. Um, and... Same thing, um, the, the other issue facing updates right now is a, a Mac OS bug. And uh, let me go back into screen share. Tom's Guide is apparently ripping off Forbes for their headline here. Nasty Mac OS flaw is bricking MacBooks. Don't install this update. Again, uh, I, I actually work pretty hard not to source articles from Forbes just because I'm so over their, their Apple hate. Because everything that's that 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 happens with iOS or with Mac OS is nasty surprise found in new update. iOS users in for nasty surprise. iPhone 12 users will have a nasty surprise. Lame. Stop using that. But this is the first article I caught from this when I started researching the issue. Tom's Guide, you're better than this. Maybe you're not better than this, but you should still not do it. Um, written up by Paul Wagonsile. Wagonsile? A new Mac OS update is causing more problems than it fixes, with Mac users reporting a host of nasty problems, including bricked MacBooks. Uh, we're talking about Catalina 10.15.4. 
which came out April 8th. Um, so some quotes from people from the Mac forums. It bricked my my uh, OS. Uh, it bricked my MacBook. Uh, other people are reporting that this is causing a problem with disk usage. So again, you recently updated a MacBook, and now you're having issues transferring large files or Time Machine, uh, because Time Machine moves large files around. Part of the update could be causing some problems for that. So depending on how much you depend on some of those features, it could lead to a MacBook bricking, or you might be totally fine. You know, if, you're, if your MacBook use is a bit more casual, then you might not have any issues with this. And that, again, we're at the very beginnings of an issue here. And one of the reasons why I want to spend a little time on this podcast, bringing up this, this issue, so that we can just be on the lookout. Family and friends, maybe you've got an aunt who uses a MacBook and she starts to describe that something funky is going on with their MacBook. Apple is terrible about reporting problems with software and with malware. And they're pretty consistent about removing off-topic or irrelevant posts from their own community forums. A few folks have been complaining that when they've complained about this issue, that their post has been pulled from the Apple community, and there's no way to really properly verify that. So uh, worth having on your radar, Samsung Note 9, just look, just 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 watch, just keep an eye out. You don't want your screen baking right now. And uh, Mac OS, the newest Catalina update, the one that came out April 8th, try some large file transfers if you're worried about it, but check your time machine backups to make sure they're completing properly. If your time machine backups are completing properly, it sounds to me like this recent bug is probably not gonna affect you. <clears throat> um, from the experimenter, wow, I haven't heard of that regarding Apple community. You absolutely need to spend some time watching uh, um, Luis Rossman uh, complain about Apple's, uh, Apple's public stance on issues facing MacBooks and iPhones. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty hilarious. Ah. <laughs> Get this out of the way. And Route Night 5, Linus from uh, LTT is still maining a Note 9, so we'll see on the WAN show if he mentions display problems. Um, I'll be really curious to see if that spreads. Because to me, that also sounds like it could just be a bad batch of Note 9s. You know, something changes in the display settings, and there was one batch of panels that went out, right? Samsung makes so many screens. Maybe one just had some issue with power management. So a thousand screens made it out there for a phone that sold in the millions. And you're like, okay, now the internet echo chamber can explode this problem, make it sound like it's way bigger than it really is. But the fact that there's been an immediate sort of confirmation from other people facing similar issues means that something happened in that code that triggered the bad batch of screens. Now it's it becomes the 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 support the support play. Will Samsung appropriately identify the issue, um, correct for the issue, and help people fix some of their phones if they've been affected by the issue? And see, I'm mean, glad it could just be lemons that went bad. Um, the only reason why I feel like there is an appropriate sort of linking. The idea of linking this is the fact that so many of these happened all at the same time. So that to me is too coincidental for it to just be, oh, well, I got a bad Note 9 and it went bad. And it went bad at exactly the same time as 10 other people on these forums in exactly the same way. <laughs> So um, moving right along, one last little news story before we, we hit the Reddit plug. Uh, I, I didn't know if this would affect anyone. It kind of doesn't affect anyone. But if you were out there like me and you were still use, using Hangouts for anything, um, I still use Hangouts as my main text uh, interface app. Uh, Google Hangouts is officially rebranded as Google Chat. So uh, Google has uh, continued the reshaping of G Suite. Oh, sorry, this is written up by Mike Moore, uh, per, uh, published by Tech Radar. Oh, let me drop the link in there. I ended up pulling the MSN feed for some reason, but drop that right there. 
Uh, Google has continued reshaping uh, the reshaping of G Suite with the rebranding of its Hangouts chat, chat and collaboration service. Hangouts, which allows users to chat online, will now be known as Google Chat in the enterprise edition of Google's productivity suite, according to The Verge. Uh, hold on, I want to get down to this. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, I, th I thought there was a line in here. Uh, so anyway, um, basically nothing's changing. The, the actual app and the service and the, 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 the functionality, exactly the same. <laughs> They're just changing the name. Um, I was a little concerned. So here's the deal. I really like Google Messages and RCS Chat. I mean, some really cool stuff. I use Google Fi. And I was someone who was on Google Voice back in the day. And I cannot separate myself from the amazing, broad web chat and web calling features that I started with with Google Voice. So if you're someone like me, I am not a regular user. On my desk right now, I've got four phones and three more on the table behind me with uh, a Chromebook that I'm wrapping up a long-term write-up on, uh, two Windows laptops, a gaming notebook, and a, a bunch of little tablets that we kind of spread throughout the house. Because that's what I do for a living. And anytime I pick up a device, I want to be able to check my text messages. I have always had this ability from the early days of Google Voice. So Google Messages does not get that done for me. If I'm on my desktop or if I go over to my laptop, I want seamless communication transfer. And, and, and again, I wanna be able to like, I have Gmail open right now, Gmail is open. And because of the way that Hangouts stapled itself to Gmail, I can text anybody directly out of Gmail. I don't have to go to a different, messages.google.com website and scan a QR code. And then it's linked to that computer, but not to three of my other phones. Not okay. Google Fi is a web-based telecommunication service that acts as an MVNO. I don't wanna lose my ability to move back and forth seamlessly. And so far it seems like Hangouts is the only way for me to get that done. So, um, so I'm sticking with Hangouts, but again, again, apparently my Hangouts is going to have the exact same icon and the exact same functionality, and it's just going to be called Google Chat. So, uh, so that's that's pretty fun. And uh, hold on, oh, the experiment here: Hangouts Duo Allo Now Chat. Isn't Allo properly dead? Didn't they they properly pull Allo? So now it's just Hangouts Duo messages and chat. Um, fat Fat Produce. How many companies are actually using Hangouts Google Chat these days? Matt Tyler. Google will keep throwing stuff. He didn't say stuff until it sticks. See, this to me though is is actually a little bit of a. This to me is um, a positive move for Google. Like there's potential here. Like I feel Google's biggest problem is they come out with a product, it kind of gets a little bit of an a little bit of an adoption, and then they scrap it. And they come up with a totally different new product when instead, if they had just stuck with Hangouts and iterated on Hangouts, there's no reason why Duo and Allo should have been separate apps. They should have been the services of a new Hangouts. The branding would have stayed. You might have had some issues as people you know, migrated to a new app or a new platform, but all the functionality just would have seamlessly moved. There's no reason why you pull the plug on that and then you, oh, well now here's uh, two completely different apps to replace the functionality that you used to have in one app. That's the thing that's driving me crazy with how Google structures these projects is because it, it does just seem to be built on the name brand recognition and popularity. Instead of iterating and improving a product over time, let's just make a totally new product. That'll fix the problem. I'm not leaving Hangouts. 
JMX Warrior, if they just stuck with Hangouts, we'd all be using it now. <laughs> Um, burn, burn, uh, burn to Otis, burn, burn, burn totus. Cause it's like burn notice and burn notice is an amazing show. Um, I'm still salty about Google plus I know first world problems. I miss Google plus and, and I like, I miss Google plus from before the YouTube integration days. That was such a vibrant, um, social networking community. And I had so much fun putting together circles and, uh, I had a, a 360 degree video community. I had the biggest 360 degree video community with dozens of, of users. But I mean, it was so it was so fun to put together, you know, like what Facebook pages kind of does. Google Plus did way better, and then Google destroyed it. It's so sad. Ah, happier days of better experimentation. So um, that does it for the news block. I'm only running a little long on the podcast so far. So let's knock out this uh, uh, meme wrangle at Google Plus RIP. You will be remembered. Um, every every podcast has a subreddit. Uh, if you're not familiar, reddit.com is the popular social news site where you can upvote and downvote news stories to help them in, with their visibility and their popularity. My podcast is no different, but where podcasts will often use a subreddit as a community hangout or a place to tell the podcast hosts how cool they are, or just a place to kind of collect news stories that the podcaster might want to use, my pod, my um, my subreddit is built around trying to promote content that users feel deserves more attention. So if you go to reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles, and I'm going to go ahead and drop that in the live chat right now, reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. This is a project that I've been trying to work on for the last several years. It is self-promotion positive. So if you go to a larger subreddit, they always have rules like you can't self-promote your own content. And then they ban you from the subreddit if you try to post something you made. Um, especially like a larger subreddit like R Android. I, I can't share my stuff to R Android. Other people sharing my stuff to R Android get it pulled. The, you're at the whim of the mods. So if it's less popular content, those larger subreddits have a vested interest in trying to keep the most popular stuff feeding to their subreddit so they have more users coming back to to, to look at things on that subreddit. My subreddit, I want it to be a feeder so that people who deserve more attention, people who should be getting more attention, can start to bubble up with some better SEO. You know, if someone's searching for a review on something a bit more obscure and it's shared on glowing rectangles, then maybe that'll help them in their overall Google search rankings. So reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. You can share your own stuff or you can also just submit stuff from content creators that you enjoy. Uh, these are the top stories from, uh, from glowing rectangles. Let me get this out of the way right here. And uh, A number one with a bullet, it is not, it, it, I am not always at the top of my own subreddit. In fact, last week I wasn't even in the top five, but because I had a major review come out some punchable face guy with a doofy hat and uh, showing off his his rear end, uh, Bruce Springsteen style. Uh, LG V60 review is the number one story. Um, immediately after that, uh, there was a great article on ZDNet that I shared uh, talking about some, some of the more detailed use of using the V60 with an active stylus, and it's a comparison putting the V60 up against a Note 10, uh, comparing features back and forth. It's a great article. This The the author of that article, Michael, who, who wrote that? Um, let me pull it up real quick. Yeah, Matthew Miller over at ZDNet um, sort of detailed why he was such a fan of the Note series and the S Pen. I dropped that link in the live chat too. Um, goes through and, and and really digs deep into all of the stylus use that he uses on the Note 10 and whether or not he can replicate it on the uh, on the LG V60. Great article. Uh, after that, one of my new one of my newest favorite channels is Gadget Byte. I love their style. I 
I am exposed to phones that we don't get here in the United States. Um, but I just dig their review setup and I dig their commentary. And it's such a chill review style. It is so much fun to watch. But they did a Q&A uh, episode, or a Q&A video. And one of the major questions, um, where do you get your review units from? So that is some insightful conversation right now, you know, especially for folks who might be interested in getting into making their own content, doing their own reviews. Everybody has a different story. You know, how I got into tech reviewing is totally different than how someone else got into tech reviewing, um, how, how I source phones, how I participate, how I reach out to PR companies. Everyone has a different strategy. So you can learn a lot from some of these creator chats, some of these conversations that creators have with their own audience. And to me, that's also just interesting. I like seeing the behind the scenes. I like seeing how the sausage is made. So, you know, I, I like promoting it when people put their own stuff out there like that. So that's uh, the number two. And the number three spot, my, my buddies, my pals over at All About Android, uh, they had an episode also checking out the LG V60. And of course, like uh, like me, a major part of the commentary was talking about how huge this phone is. Um, but again, uh, another another viewpoint, another take. Uh, Mike Wolfson was the guest uh, talking about the V60. And rounding out the rest of the top stories, LFA reviews with an awesome true wireless earbud showdown, looking at the uh, Sennheiser Momentum, the One More True Wireless, and the Sony XM3s. A, a really, really well-written article uh, talking about um, online safety from Pup on Tech. Uh, if your family or friends are starting to get scams uh, or um, clickbait or not clickbait, what's the word I'm trying to look for? Uh, malware scams and uh, email scams, just some tips and tricks to help protect your family and friends from, uh, from getting scammed. Uh, this, uh, this was kind of a fun video from Ryan Thomas, an opinion piece on the meaning of the word pro. Uh, the word pro on gadgets is misleading, and I think a lot of us would agree with that. And then I don't know why these got all weird and pixelated. YouTube has been having some issues. So I know some of the YouTube videos have been looking really rough on the subreddit. But I really liked this video from Cobra... I can't say that. Cobra told ya. <laughs> Only 2,800 subscribers, 2,800 subscribers, but he's got a, a, a Huawei, is a P, Huawei P40, and he's trying out the face unlock, and he has twins. So, uh, again, kind of a t another look at um, biometric security. We talk about, you know, oh, the security of a fingerprint or the security of face unlock, but we don't always talk about how biometric security is only good against general other people. But when you compare biometric security against family members, your security drops significantly. And uh, he does a, a test on the P40, scanning one of his twin son's faces and then trying to unlock with his other twin son. And I think you can imagine what the results might be. But a great video. Uh, I mean, a, 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 again, commentary worth discussing, worth checking out. And especially here in the United States, we don't get as much Huawei coverage because of obvious shenanigans and obvious issues. So um, some, some, some really solid content. I'm going to take a quick sip of water here. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to keep this project healthy and growing. Every week we pick up a few more subscribers, a few more followers. Every week I see someone new sharing a video or, or leaving a comment. And it's that active participation that matters the most. You find a content creator, they put out a video, you like that video. A passive view is not enough to keep them making new videos for you as an audience member. Finding whatever opportunity you can to support your local content creator has never been more important. And with everything that's going on in the world, all of us are dealing with some pretty severe life work changes. Some extra effort makes a huge difference to someone just getting started, someone with a channel that's maybe plateauing or is maybe starting to drop off of it because of popularity algorithms on YouTube, and just really trying to hammer home that media literacy education. You know, what you see in your YouTube feed is not the organic timeline of stuff that got put out there. YouTube is just like Facebook. 
YouTube wants you to spend as much time watching YouTube as possible, so their algorithms are designed to manipulate your feed to try and get you to do that. So you might be missing stories on other uh, cell phone manufacturers, on other gadget manufacturers, on other tips and tricks videos, less popular topics, but from hosts that you enjoy watching their content. This is the right time to make that little bit extra effort. If it's on my subreddit, thank you so much. Thank you everyone who is sharing and supporting and most of all, upvoting the content so that it becomes more visible on Reddit. But beyond that, any effort you can make is going to be a significant benefit beyond just the passive view. I watched that video, it was neat. Cool, I, I, I hope they make me more stuff, but I'm just gonna sit here and not do anything to help them out. Sharing, subscribing, thumbs upping, leaving comments, participation matters and it matters more than it ever has before. So uh, if you check out my subreddit, reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles, I say this every week, if you've never been there before, you're going to find a video producer or, an, or a writer or a content creator that you've never seen before and you're gonna like their stuff. And, and that's gonna be cool. Like you'll have, you'll have found an entire channel of new stuff to watch especially with everything that's going on, you're probably burning through your regular subscriptions faster than you, you ha would normally have before. So let's add some new people to that watch list and let's help them out. Let's see if we can find ways to boost their visibility, boost their search engine optimization, and, and also grow a community about sharing and diversifying the conversation. If we leave it up to YouTube algorithms, then you're just gonna get video after video about Apple versus Samsung. And that's boring. <laughs> so let's do something about it. I am trying to be the change I hope to see in the world. <laughs> Whew. All right, let me take a sip here. Again, we've got the leaf blowers back outside my window. What are they blowing? They already walked by once. There was nothing for them to blow the first time. And now they're walking by again. Those comments taken out of context uh, will probably shut down my Twitch channel. <laughs> All right, let's get into some gadget chat real quick. I know I keep saying real quick and then I spend a long time talking about this, but for those of you out there who are still heartbroken over losing Windows phones, there is an incredible little project starting up that I am anxiously gonna be following because I hope it's gonna be good. It's called Lumia W-O-A, Lumia Windows on ARM. It's a project to build full Windows 10 uh, compatibility for Lumia, the Lumia 950 and the Lumia 950 XL. So I'm just gonna screen share this real quick. Um, it's a GitHub project. Um, it's got a nice little landing page and a website now. It's growing some, uh, um, some popularity, uh, but this is the Windows you know and love. It's a project to enable Windows 10 on a phone. And, and it's some smart stuff because they're, they're trying to keep the functionality of things like Continuum, which was the Windows Phone desktop mode, and then also incorporating the parts of Windows Phone that enabled things like uh, cell phone connectivity so that we still have support for radios and uh, modems Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, that was, those were always the sticky parts, was getting good driver support for that stuff. Right outside my window. I cannot, where did I? Oh, let's turn it off and on again, right outside my window. Hold on, I've got to find my, I had my earbuds out here and now I can't find them. Let me, uh, let me just grab some cans real quick. I'm not even gonna plug these cans in. I just gotta block my ears. Freaking. Ah. Uh, all right, DT 770s to the rescue. Anyway, Windows on ARM. Uh, we're gonna be seeing a whole bunch of Microsoft hardware where you can run Windows 10 on ARM chipsets. But um, ah, oh, there we go. Where you can run uh, Windows 10 on ARM chipsets. That to me is an exciting side uh, side evolution of Windows 10, what Microsoft is trying to achieve. And it fits in line with my 
conversations. Like I've been saying since the Snapdragon 835, what that phones like the LG V30, uh, Galaxy S8, that you have near laptop grade power in your pocket. And really all we need are some better tools to get more laptop grade use out of our, out of our mobile devices. So you pair that with a portable display like the Lapau that I reviewed or a Next Dock. The notion that you need to have some type of MacBook Air style computer, a tablet and a phone immediately falls apart. If we have Windows running on ARM, we know Apple is working on some kind of uh, Mac OS on ARM style uh, product, some type of keyboard laptop shell, but it's using an ARM chipset. All of these things, all of these things now have so much more functionality. Every phone that you've used could become the next laptop you would wanna use. And then every time you buy a new phone, your laptop also gets an immediate upgrade. So this Lumia project, it's not gonna affect a lot of people because there were, were what, 100 people like me that had Lumia 950s. Um, but the repurposing of older hardware, trying to find some of the gaps that Windows 10 has for mobile use. The Surface Duo that's gonna be coming out from Microsoft is, uh, um, is gonna be running Android. But there's no reason why with a little refinement, Windows 10 on ARM couldn't be reformatted to work better for a phone screen. So that project, I'm gonna be really excited to follow. I'm, I'm very curious to see what some home developers can do with a little bit more exposure, a little bit more time and see if we can get that stuff up off the, um, up off the ground. Um, Simon says, Hypno, what was HP's attempt at phones inserted into tablets called? I don't know that HP ever had, um, uh, let me see if I can take this off. If the leaf blowers stay away for a while, I'll leave my headphones off. I mean, I under the thing is, I like, I know it's not su super dominating, like because of the microphone that I'm using, it's the leaf blowers don't destroy the audio, but I can't think <laughs> when they're right outside my window. I just keep derailing. Um, HP had the Elite Dock. Um, they also had a lap dock. So, so on the HP Windows phone, you could dock it and then have it go to a desktop monitor. And then they also had a laptop style dock. I don't know that they ever did a tablet. Excuse me. Um, I think uh, Asus is really the company that never really got enough credit for mixed multi-mode modular designs. Uh, the transformer tablets that had laptop keyboards, the the phone pad, the pad phone, and then all of the docks and accessories for ROG. Um, I really think Asus has been the most consistent about trying to offer more than just phone or more than just tablet use with their with their product line. Uh, Meme Ranglad, I had the Transformer too. I, I'm so upset I got rid of my Transformer. I never, never should have gotten rid of that tablet. It should be a museum piece. Uh, it, like it, it was, a, a, a wonderful twist on on what you can do with a tablet. And again, especially like coming back and using a phone like the V60, I'm getting really hyped for products that are coming back to an idea of modularity. You know, you this can be a totally regular phone or it can be a note competitor with an active pen or it can be sort of a folding phone competitor with dual screen you can kind of buy as much phone as you want. If you want to go whole hog, you know, 999 gets you the phone, the case, an active pen, and a 256 gigabyte SD card. Sure, $1,000, go to town. Um, but if you want to piece it differently, then you, you can kind of buy less if you don't need all of that. So as much as like, you know, I've seen people complain like, oh, well, this phone supports a stylus, but it doesn't have a silo. So I can't keep the pen in the phone. I understand that, but I don't want to have three different versions of the same phone. And then also one of those versions has a stylus, but then has to have a smaller battery because the stylus takes up space in the phone. So again, it, it, pros and cons for sure. But I, I really hope that, you know, Microsoft doing more work on ARM, uh, Google and Apple are going to be fighting out in the Chromebook versus iPad space. 
And this is part of the conversation that I had with Warren about USB-C and desktop modes. I, I think in the next year or two, the need for a standalone $800 to $1,000 laptop is going to be wrecked by ARM-based computers. Um, and in a small part, using your phone as your ARM-based computer. <laughs> From Hakey. Hey, don't show that phone anymore on the live stream. I'm drooling over here. Oh, JMX Warrior. I'll press F in the live chat for that, man. Speaking of a museum piece, my HTC One M7 2013 won't power up. It's completely dead. Oh, that's sad. Everyone say, say uh, press F for a fallen comrade. The HTC One M7 was such a transformative phone. Uh, again, I'd, there's still that small hope, that small little kernel uh, glow in my chest that maybe HTC as a brand label could come back. It just makes me really sad. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't like having a tech world where brands like HTC and Motorola aren't competitive in some form. Sony, LG, these labels meant something, were formative. I think HMD has been doing an okay job trying to revive Nokia, but you know, just think about how much competition we used to have, and now we're we're stuck in a perpetual Sam Apple conversation. All right. Um, so uh, I, I have to share this story because I took a lot of grief on Twitter, and everyone who disagreed with me was wrong. Um, I mean, just objective. That's a fact. Is that <laughs> uh, Sony showed off their new uh, PS5 controller, and I like it. I, I know a lot of people are complaining because the top view looks a little bit more like an Xbox controller. The 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 wings um, on the controller are a little bit thinner. Uh, but I love this kind of paneled design. Uh, you get kind of a close-up shot here. By the way, I'm sharing the Engadget article, but Sony put these photos out themselves. Um, the microphone that's going to be built into this, the USB-C connector on the front, and just the way that the panels scoop around the triggers... I, I like what they're doing here. I know a lot of people were saying like, oh, well, they're just ripping off the Xbox. But really, if you look at their design, what they're doing um, opposite uh, the PS4 controller is just flattening out the PS4 controller. So when you hold a PS3 controller, it's really skinny. From PlayStation 1 to PlayStation 3, they kept the really skinny wings and the, the hard circles around the D-pad and the, uh, the buttons on, on the right-hand side. PlayStation 4, those circles are not hard, hard to find. The whole thing got chunkier and doughier, but just it got thicker, but the wings angled down more severely. So really, this controller just looks like they flattened the wings out. So um, yeah, I'm digging it. I like this layout. I do not like the Xbox layout where they trade the D-pad and the left analog uh, uh, joystick I know Xbox fans and I'm not trying to throw shade at Xbox fans here I know Xbox, Xbox fans like their controller layout but it's literally the only offset left analog stick every other controller has matched analog sticks so when I go to my Steel series to game on Android or on my PC it's the same as my PS4 controller. My, my thumbs naturally hit those dual analog sticks that way. So we get this, we get the look of it, um, little color accents, some RGB lighting. I, I like this white on black panda look, especially because it looks kind of like the uh, time travel uniforms from, uh, from Avengers, you know, like, Looks kind of like a, a little time travel -y, white paneled, plastic, Ant-Man meets Iron Man kind of a look. I dig it. A bunch of people like had to immediately like, you know, uh, Sony put out the press release, so I, I reshared it, I retweeted it, and I went like, oh yeah, this looks so good. And a bunch of people like had to retweet me with barf emojis, and all of those people are wrong. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Um, 
JMX Warrior, I love the look of it. Vazicos 8, it's good for a PlayStation controller. <laughs> See, that's the right, that's the right reply. If you don't like PlayStation, it's like, well, I mean, it's good for garbage, I suppose. <laughs> from Heiki, that's a beautiful design. Um, from Michael SSBU, the controller looks comfy, I just dislike the colors. And like, well, there aren't any colors. It's white and black with blue accents, but I like Panda. I'm currently using the uh, the white and clear PlayStation 4 controller, but something tells me, I wonder, folks, over under, what are the odds that Sony might come out with more colors than just this one color that they showed off? It's a mystery. I suppose there's there's no way we could speculate on potential for other controller colors out there. But but honestly, I mean, like, if this comes in blue, I'm getting it in blue. I would have bought the PlayStation 4 in blue, but it was a controller emergency, and I had to jet to Target, and the only one they had was the, the white and clear or the black, and I already had a black controller, so I didn't want two black controllers. <laughs> oh, me, man, glad that's actually a good, a good point, too. Switch controllers have asymmetrical joysticks also. Yeah, so I guess Switch controllers are wrong also. So that's, 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 that's correct. I mean, it's like Switch and, oh no, because it also mimics the GameCube. So the GameCube controller is also incorrect. But I think Nintendo has been on some kind of fun mind-altering substance since uh, N64. Because I, I still, to this day, cannot figure out how I'm supposed to hold and use an N64 controller. I mean, it's like, it's a trident and I have two hands. But if we're looking to Nintendo, for rational controller design, um, I, I don't think that's the right play. <laughs> I think we looked at Nintendo. Oh wait, what does the Nintendo Pro Controller look like? Does the Nintendo Pro Controller have um, mismatched analog sticks? Nintendo Switch Pro Controller. I honestly, I honestly don't know. I, I don't have a Switch, a game on my phone. So it does. The Nintendo Switch does use incorrect analog sticks. All right, that's good to know. I, I've been always looking at things like the 8-bit, like the 8-bit dough. So like, you know, I've been looking at these. You know, you kind of mix a, a Super Nintendo controller with a PlayStation controller, and that to me looks correct. That to me looks wrong. And that's a cheap, like, knockoff controller, I guess. Oh, there's the Pro, con uh, the pro Wireless controller for the Nintendo Switch. Yeah, I, I, I don't understand. I don't understand why someone would want one thumb way over and one thumb way up high. I mean, do you hold your controller sideways? Is that what I'm missing? Is that you game like this? Is that how you do it? Because that, how do you? Anyway. Um... <laughs> um, from the experimenter. Actually, it's funny. The Game GameCube controller made it made it into the Switch. Vazico say, it's always funny to disagree with some gadget guy. Also, side-scrolling pages in the app drawer is correct. <laughs> side-scrolling app drawers are never correct. You swipe up to get the apps. You should keep swiping up for a continuous list of apps. It's one ergonomic gesture. Why do you swipe up to get something and then page to get something else especially when the gesture to go back is a lateral swipe. So I, I, I wasn't gonna bring this up, but I lasted as long as I could um, on my V60. Uh, I am now back on Nova Launcher so I can swipe up and then get all my apps. See, it's just one, one gesture. And then when I swipe down, I get my notifications. All one gesture. It's one movement vertically for everything that I want on my phone. I don't go up one direction, sideways on another direction, and then if I miss the sideways swipe and I accidentally hit too close to the edge of the screen, it's the back button, and then the back button makes me leave my app drawer. <laughs> that is incorrect. <laughs> that is not good ergonomic design. Well, wasn't good for Samsung? It's not good for LG. <laughs> I have I have lost nine viewers <laughs> in talking about controllers and uh, um, uh, phone UI ergonomics. Uh, 
And JMX Warrior knows what's up. All right, let's get into some actual gadget chat here. Um, the 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 Sony PlayStation 5 DualSense controller, I, I dig it. Um, I, I'm not going to be getting a PS5 right at launch, but I like what uh, Sony's doing there with their design. I'm really anxious to see if they end up doing the, uh, the pizza slice warmer uh, design for the PlayStation 5. I can't believe that they'll do that after the Xbox looks so clean. So, um, a lot of folks, a lot of folks, maybe the biggest story that people were tagging me on on social media over this last week was LG. LG finally named their next phone a new fork of LG smartphone design, a, a new product line. This seems to be the replacement for what would have been the G series phones. And uh, from LG's own newsroom, the press release. Uh, LG embarks on new product roadmap with LG Velvet. No, no information. Um, th there's nothing to see here, but they told us what the name of the phone would be. With today's smartphones becoming more and more alike and difficult to distinguish by technical specifications alone, LG Electronics is answering the challenge by embarking on a new product roadmap that will emphasize distinctive designs and tactile elegance to set itself apart. The first device to illustrate this new philosophy is the upcoming LG Velvet, featuring a unique raindrop camera and a symmetrical flowing form factor that is both pleasing to the eye and pleasing to the touch. So, um, the, uh, the renders, or do I have? Oh, no, I do. Okay, let me go back into screen share. I've got, I've got the, the photos up here. So this was the concept sketch that came out, the LG V-Cut kind of in the background. And when we talked about this before, what I was really hoping, and I didn't quite see as clearly on like the Twitter photo that was shared, I thought the corners came to points. But apparently the corners are gonna be more rounded off. So I was really hoping that the look of this was gonna be a bit more Lumia inspired. If you pick up a phone like the Lumia 928 or the Lumia 830 from back in the day, some, some bold, hard-edged metal and plastic uh, Nokia designs, I really loved the look of metal flowing into plastic. And here it would be metal flowing into glass and, and having sort of bold and sharp corners or padded corners, to me, I think is a very striking look. That's why I've been so positive on Sony design is uh, they've held to their hard rectangle obelisk look. Even for softening up the edges a little bit, it is a, it is a very distinctive look. The Xperia 1 and Xperia 5 are gorgeous phones in just their hard edged modern simplicity. So we saw these sketches and, and a few folks have taken to trying to pump out some renders. <clears throat> some concepts on what this might look like in real life. So this is all coming by way of technophilo.com. And this is a concept on what the velvet might look like in various colors. We do not have, as far as I know, we don't have, um, we don't have the specifications on dimensions just yet. We don't know what the aspect ratio for the screen is gonna be. So I think what they're doing here with these, these concept renders is assuming kind of a 21 by nine form factor, which makes sense considering that the V60 is 20.5 by nine, might as well bump up that extra 0.5 for the height of the phone. So I'm assuming if these were built on 21 by nine, this is what we'd be taking a look at. So uh, there's the little raindrop where the camera modules start from the super large one. Maybe these will be an ultra wide and a zoom? I'm not sure what you would do with a triple camera after the V the V60 went to dual camera with time of flight. I kind of like the time of flight. If you like taking portrait mode photos, it is kind of handy to have, but I wouldn't necessarily say that that's a deal breaker if they got rid of time of flight on a, sort of more of a mid-range premium pivot. But I do like the, the big circle, medium size circles and little camera flash circle um, all kind of bordering one side. I always like it better when, when camera hardware is center punched, um, when it makes the phone perfectly symmetrical. But if these phones really are super skinny, then maybe it makes sense to offset the camera module so you can hold the phone while you take photos. Um, but yeah, it looks really Sony adjacent and I'd be fine with that. 
I'd, I'd like more phones looking like Sony's than trying to rip off Samsung and Apple with stovetop camera modules. I don't like the look of that. I'd rather see something different. And again, if you're going to piggyback on design elements, why not go for something that's that's lesser used? <laughs> Sony Xperia's love these like circular, hard-edged, angular, rectangular looks. I think that looks pretty sharp. I like it. Here are a couple of the other photos that they've used for these mock-ups. Uh, a woman holding the velvet. I have no idea what the size or dimensions of this phone might be. So something tells me this looks a little big for what we might get. But, or maybe her hands are just really, really small and they don't have the scaling correct. Um, and then here's the same mock-up. But trying to, um, trying to estimate what the front face might look like. A little off-center hole punch camera for the selfie camera. I, I wouldn't be surprised if LG did that, uh, just knowing that they're not gonna do periscoping or telescoping selfie cameras. Uh, that that makes sense to me that they'd, they'd opt for a hole punch on their next phone, because they always seem to be about a year behind on design uh, elements like that. But then like the uh, the concept sketch they that is sort of white and black, they did uh, uh, black and white versions too, which look pretty cool. But I would love to see this line of phones come in colors, like a deep, rich purple and nice blue. Um, the, uh, the LG G8 in red is still one of the best looking phones, in my opinion, of 2019, just because it came in red. <laughs> but yeah, so if you, if you wanted your phone to look more like a, a surfboard, I guess uh, the the G replacement, the LG G replacement, is gonna is gonna satisfy that. Um, yeah, I'm 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 really hopeful. I want that phone, 21 by nine, uh, 1080p display, a Snapdragon 700 series, maybe a 730 or 765. Give me a respectable amount of storage, but keep the headphone jack and SD card expansion. And I think you've got a baller option to fight these newer, more expensive uh, flagship phones. You'll have all the power you really need to get better than daily driver stuff done. Hopefully LG maintains all of the upgradability. Again, SD card expansion and, and uh, being able to plug in wired headphones. And we'll have a killer option um, opposite some of the, the premium set. I, I don't see any downsides here. But again, it's like, uh, I, I was a little disappointed. Um, most of the people tagging me were like, hey, have you seen this? What are your thoughts? What do you think? I mean, I just thought it was kind of heartwarming because I know I'm billed as the LG fanboy, but it's not to say that I haven't been promoting Windows phones, Blackberries, Sony Xperia's, I really liked the Pixel 4. You know, like, my big hook, my big commentary will always be competition. If I don't see competitive differences between manufacturers, that's when I get cranky. And I don't feel we have real competition when, especially here in the United States, 80% of the conversation is dominated by Samsung versus Apple. That's boring. I want more. I want phones to look like laptops. I want phones for specific niche uses. I want phones for mainstream use. I want thin and light phones. I want battery hogging gaming phones. I want workstation phones. I want all phones, not, well, Samsung did it, so that's the only thing that can be considered viable. That's lame. <laughs> so saying, you know, like uh, trying to criticize the Velvet because it looks a little like an Xperia is not gonna is not gonna make me feel bad. I I like the Xperias. I think the Xperias look really good. So that to me, that could be peanut butter jelly time right there. Uh, JMX Warrior saying red one for me. A DTNL saying he likes the blue color. Um, uh, Pukey. I don't know if that's how you pronounce your, your Twitch name. I'm not crazy about the tall and skinny look, but that seems to be the way these things are going right now. Our phones are getting bigger, but if our phones are also getting taller and skinnier, you, you have some type of ergonomic consideration for how you can hold it. At least it's not an essential gem. <laughs> um, uh, Simon says Hypno saying the deep purple rocks. Matt Tyler, it looks like an Xperia 1, Xperia Z, and an LG had a baby. Yeah, it does. It looks very much like that. 
Uh, Root Knight 5, me too. I'm hoping it has a flush back. Uh, I'll be curious to see if they can solve the depth issue with the larger camera sensors. These larger camera sensors need more space. So one solution could be going back to last year's 12 megapixel sensor or adding extra case and extra battery depth while you curve the sides of the displays maybe that's a way that we can get back to having a flush rear. But since the G6, I I don't think LG gets enough credit for when their phones can properly sync the camera modules so it's a an unbroken surface on the back of the phone. Um, from Zach2, what price do you want at some gadget guy? That's tricky. So let's say the Velvet is a 5G capable phone. Unfortunately for LG, it seems like they're really playing ball with carriers. Carrier might demand a lesser expensive phone with a 5G. So I think something that might be reasonable, six gigabytes of RAM, 128 gigabytes of storage, probably UFS two, not UFS three. Uh, let's say a 4,000 milliamp hour battery, a Snapdragon 700 series with the extra 5G modem that has to sit outside the chipset. I'd probably ballpark, I'd want 599, I'd probably ballpark like $699. Get an LG that is back in line with what premium phones used to cost back in the you know, Galaxy S8 LG V30 days. And I think that would be an appropriate pivot because that's kind of a lateral move. Uh, you know, a Snapdragon 700 series is gonna deliver the power between a Snapdragon 845 and a Snapdragon 855. It's gonna be a little weaker for GPU and gaming performance, but if you've got a headphone jack, please LG, don't drop the headphone jack, um, and you can upgrade the storage, then somewhere around that 699 price tag starts to make a lot of sense again, especially considering what we're gonna be talking about next with OnePlus because there's a gap in the United States market in the $400 to $700 territory. Because we should talk about the OnePlus 8 next. <laughs> uh, let me get this out of the way here. Oh, and also for folks out there, because I've, I've had to kind of try and reinforce this idea in a number of conversations. Screen diagonal is not what we should be paying attention to. So when someone says, oh man, this is so huge because it has a 6.8 inch screen. That's not the surface area. As phones get taller and skinnier, you get less screen per the diagonal. So someone was trying to say like, I could never use the V60 um, because I had a Mate 20X Pro and that had a 7.2 inch display, and this has a 6.8 inch display, so it's gonna be almost as big as a Mate 20, a Mate 20X. That's not how you measure a screen. Because the Mate 20X has a different aspect ratio, it's actually, the screen on the Mate 20X is 20% larger than the screen on the LG V60. Not to say that the B60 isn't a big chunky phone, but you don't just measure off of one line, one diagonal, and then that doesn't give you any clear idea of how big a phone is. So let's say the, the you know, let, let, let's match it up. Let's say the Velvet has a 6.8 inch display and the V60 has a 6.8 inch display. The Velvet is going to be noticeably smaller, not, not like tremendously smaller, but it will be noticeable how much smaller the velvet will be with the same screen diagonal, just with the difference in a 20.5 by nine to a 21 by nine aspect ratio display. It will pop in smaller off of the side bezels. And this phone won't have any bezels there. Um, so it's gonna feel even smaller than that in the hand. But yeah, I, I'm kind of hoping somewhere around 699. Uh, that to me makes sense. It, it, it fits properly with LG's current strategy. It gives carriers, especially carriers in the United States, a 5G capable device that that can seem like it's a bit more of a bargain. I, I, I don't see where there, there would be any misstep there. <laughs> uh, 
Simon says, Hepno, do you think we'll see a dual screen for the Velvet? That I don't know. That, that could be interesting. I don't know that a dual screen would work great with a curved display. So I kind of feel like V-Series is going to be their mega uber productivity phone. That's going to be their note. Um, digitizer, dual displays, the works. And then different markets might get a couple different variants. Like maybe there's going to be a V60S in some other market. I don't know. But um, whatever would have been the G-Series needs to have a different offering. I know V and G were kind of coming together. They were basically becoming the same phone. The G8X is very much the parts bin of a V50. You know, they're they're not that dissimilar. Just a couple small changes between the two. So if we're getting rid of the G series, we keep the V as the big heavy duty productivity phone and we introduce a new more mainstream option. It's kind of like Huawei. You've got your P series, which are the fashion phones, and you've got your mate series, which are the productivity phones. I think LG should probably try and do something similar. <laughs> and let's get this out of the way here. Okay. So um, to, to wrap up this podcast, which is already running long, we're going to be running long because I want to do the, the, one of the main topics, obviously, uh, tomorrow. Uh, OnePlus, uh, becoming one of my favorite brands, uh, has become one of my favorite brands, is going to be holding a big online press conference. Uh, links went out. I'm sure folks are going to be watching along. I'm going to try and live tweet along with their announcement of the OnePlus 8 and the OnePlus 8 Pro. And uh, we've already gotten some links, leaks and some rumors coming out. So I wanted to spend a little time wrapping up some of the things that we should see what are some things that we should still expect? What might be a surprise coming from OnePlus? And then uh, what do we think the, the, the actual pricing is gonna be? So I know some markets, some regions have already leaked, but um, that doesn't mean that that's gonna be the same internationally, right? It's not like I can just convert Indian currency and know what the United States price is gonna be. <clears throat> so I wanted to start off with um, Android Authority had a write up here, because who, who was it that leaked it? Um, Evan Bloss. This to me is maybe, and, and, and again, I, I'm not trying to oversell this, but the timing from OnePlus to do something like this could not be better. As a reviewer, I get a completely different experience with OnePlus products than an average consumer. When OnePlus sends me a review kit, it's a review kit. I cannot tell you, I mean, I can't. I mean, I've done unboxings and stuff and I've streamed a few like, oh, look at what's in this box, oh my gosh. But again, I, I, I can't, words cannot fully express how much nicer the OnePlus experience is for a reviewer when you get this big box and it's weighted and it, it's got magnetic panels that open up and then a booklet of full of photography and design and your reviewer guide with all of the specs and charts and graphs and all of the information that you're gonna write your script with. And then you pull out that and there's a panel and there's a like a, um, how do you say that? Moleskin? Mole, moleskin? You know, those notebooks? a notebook and a pen, it's leather bound or probably faux leather bound with a strap and a tie so you can journal your thoughts on using a OnePlus phone. And then you pick up a, a, a red plated box. It's nicely weighted and slides open and it's full of cases. The, the, the red soft touch case, the sandstone cases, a carbon fiber case, and you put that over on the side. Then you pull out the phone and the phone is also in its own little weighted box and it's got all of the phone accessories and the charger and the cable and under the phone, you pull out some bullets so that you can, you can listen to music immediately from your phone because they don't keep headphones in the case anymore. Headphones don't come included in the price of the phone and it all fits together and it's beautiful and it's just so well considered. And for a couple years now, a bunch of us have been saying, sell that as a limited edition experience for consumers. You've already put the work into designing it. You're, you're trying to craft that, that emotional experience for reviewers. 
your customers would love, would adore having this, this kind of one plus fan community experience. And they've never done it until now. <laughs> So Evan Blast broke this story. Um, this is coming by way of Android Authority, written up by Adamya Sharma. I apologize because I probably mis mispronounced your name. The OnePlus 8 series is on track to launch tomorrow, and leaks are still pouring in about the new flagship killers. This latest one comes from frequent tipster Evan Blast, who has outed an image of all the contents inside the special OnePlus 8 series pop-up box on Patreon. So OnePlus recently announced that it's hosting an online pop-up event for the new series. The company has promised a special pop-up box to buyers who purchase a phone at the event. So uh, this is everything that I've been asking OnePlus to do. So you can buy the phone, sure, but offer a limited edition. You're not gonna make a ton of these, but it's gonna feel so special when someone can buy the phone fully kitted out case, wireless bullets, um, uh, uh, case options, I should say. And it's all put together in a nice package. It's not just a bunch of boxes and it all shows up on the same day in a UPS box and you tear it open and there's packing material. Make it the experience that you give reviewers because this is gorgeous. So um, if, if you were in the market for a OnePlus, to me, this would be the way that I would recommend buying a OnePlus. Will it be more expensive? Yes. <laughs> yes, it will be. It totally will be. Uh, so what they're going to, they're including this. So you get the regular phone uh, bumper case. So it's just a clear plastic case, obviously a USB cable and a charger. And then they're going to include um, a carbon bumper case. The OnePlus cases are really nice. And then I'm really curious. I'm hoping I can get my hands on one a cyan sandstone bumper case. I really like the OnePlus sandstone cases. I really miss that OnePlus phones used to be built with a grippy texture on the back of the phone, that it was just a part of the phone. But the sandstone cases replicate that nicely enough. This is the first time they've ever done a case like that in cyan. And I love cyan. Blue phones are always the best. From the Nokia Lumia 920 till today, if you can get a blue phone, you're making the correct choice. That is the phone you should get. So I'm curious to see how that's gonna feel, having the grippy rough texture on a very light, bright color. I have concerns that that might not age well. That's still the version I would wanna show off in reviews. And then uh, a pair of the wireless OnePlus Bullets Wireless Z earbuds which I think these are a refresh. Um, I don't think they're the wireless two, but I'll be curious to see if um, if that's the single driver design or the dual driver. The wireless buds two are dual driver earbuds, so I don't know what the Z are gonna be, but they might be a refresh of the single drivers, we'll have to see. So the only thing that's not in the box is the rumored wireless charging dock which that sounds like that's gonna be kind of a pricey uh, wireless charging dock. But I, this, this is a, a phenomenal way to package a OnePlus phone. I, I, I have asked for this. I tried to find my tweet. Um, I put out a tweet after the OnePlus 7T launch saying, man, OnePlus, you should really sell this kit that you sent me for reviewing the OnePlus 7T. People would love it. And uh, with everything that's going on in the world, with the situation, trying to make buying a phone feel more special, this is the right time to uh, to make your customers feel special for being uh, for being fans of your brand. From JMX Warrior, but 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 I don't like blue. LOL. That's okay. You don't have to like blue to make the correct choice. The correct choice is blue. <laughs> Uh, LFA reviews. On a good note, maybe I can finally get my hands on a used set of OnePlus Bullets wireless. <laughs> LFA, man, you are so much braver than I. I am so, especially in this day and age, I am not about buying used headphones. 
I sweat in my headphones. I I uh, produce an obnoxious amount of earwax. I am I am not about trying to pick up someone else's used headphones. Um, but you are a braver man than I. <laughs> And Dave Burns, uh, Dave Burns too. I definitely wouldn't mind a hot rod red one plus. Um, <laughs> from Hakey. So that's why you're wearing blue clothes today. I mean, I have blue is a pretty significant por portion of my wardrobe too. Um, uh, Root Night Five. I'm one of those who would dare buy used headphones. And like I said, you do you. You are braver than I am. But from years of uh, working in recording studios and cleaning out pop filters and trying to detail clean really expensive microphones and daily wiping the funk off of studio grade headphones from doing voiceover auditions. I am not about other people's biology right now. That is not my game. <laughs> and I totally expect that this would be true. LFA also replies, I rarely do, but I clean things thoroughly with alcohol. I bought some used Sony uh, WF XM3s. All I can say is people are dirty. People are filthy. Um, yeah, so that that's that's not my gig. But we've got some other OnePlus stuff to talk about. Um, a number of these types of articles, remember how I was saying, like, I'm not a big fan of sourcing Forbes. Uh, the way that Forbes writes up their consumer tech always feels um, aggressively um, angry. They're always trying to find some type of clickbait, gotcha, um, outrage, tech porn, and all we, with the headlines, you know, like nasty surprises in, so, in almost all of their Apple coverage. Where I am intensely critical of Apple as a humongous force in the world of technology, I'm, I'm often frustrated by the gotcha journalism style of Forbes write-up on Apple topics even for, obviously, my own aggressive stance on Apple criticism. So this story kind of kind of wafted through my social media, and I feel it was emblematic of the broader conversation about OnePlus as a brand, consumer expectations, and then just where we are in the market today. Excuse me. So screen sharing this. Oh, and let me do the... Man, excuse me, got them water burps. Uh, OnePlus 8 accidentally leaked by store. Bad news for fans. So uh, this is written up by Jay McGregor. The exact formula for OnePlus success is as closely guarded as the Colonel's 11 herbs and spices, but like the Colonel's recipe, it's not hard to deduce what makes it all tick. A combination of low prices reasonably high-end hardware and encouraging an us versus them mindset amongst its dedicated fan base has worked a treat but one of the core founding pillars is about to fall if a recent leak about pricing turns out to be accurate spotted by win future a recently posted and quickly deleted listing on a czech retailer website displayed european prices for all the upcoming oneplus versions uh then they go on to list the oneplus eight this is this is what I think is funny. The cheapest model, uh, Forbes needs some better uh, fact checking here. The cheapest model, the OnePlus 8 with 128 gigabytes of RAM, the, hold on, let me go out of screen share. The 128 gigabyte RAM version of the OnePlus 8 <laughs> um, came in at 719 euro. Uh, the other models appear to have also dramatically increased in price. A OnePlus 8 with 12 gigs of RAM and 256 gigabytes of storage is going to be 819 euro. And the OnePlus 8 Pro with 8 gigabytes of RAM and 128 gigabytes of storage is 919 euro. And finally, the OnePlus 8 Pro, 12 gigs of RAM, 256 gigabytes of storage, 1,009 euro. So yeah, obviously... We know what they meant, but as journalists, someone probably has commented or corrected them on 128 gigabytes of RAM. That to me would be an easy, an easy fix, but we're pretty sure they mean eight gigabytes of RAM and 128 gigabytes of storage. 
So I have to I, I, I have to embody the philosophy of one of my all-time favorite tech videos on the internet today. If you go to Tech Alter's um, YouTube channel, he has a video about why enthusiast brands will always betray you. If you're a tech fan, you're a tech enthusiast, this is entertainment to you. We enjoy debating and getting into the specs and the minutia and trying way more devices than the average consumer will ever try to use as a daily driver phone. We enjoy this. It's not just, I need to buy a new phone every three years, so what should I buy? Let me read a few reviews. We're kind of the worst. <laughs> No brand can survive on just us, and we're often the ones who are most critical, the loudest, the angriest, and constantly trying to find the lowest possible margin of profitability for someone making a consumer electronics device today. OnePlus built up this rep early in its, early in its life by being a significant cost savings against iPhones and galaxies. And it's always been at roughly two thirds the price. So when iPhones were $600 phones, OnePluses were $400 phones. But for some reason, the emotional baggage, the emotional brand philosophy on a lower cost manufacturer stays way more visceral than on a premium manufacturer. So Apple starts bumping prices up over $1,000 and we acclimatize to that. But OnePlus starts bumping up their prices and how could they succeed? They're betraying their fans. A OnePlus used to cost $400. And if you're rational, if you're not an ignorant rube, you can, you can understand the timeline on a budget brand will never last. It's not a sustainable business model. If you can't show growth, if you can't show improving profits, the brand dies. So every single time we latch on to costs and price as the only way a company can compete, we're dooming that brand. That brand will fail. Or the brand can succeed by pivoting and becoming more of a mainstream product because we're not enough. OnePlus enthusiasts who comment on YouTube videos are not enough people to keep a brand profitable. You, you need to adapt or die. And so OnePlus has steadily been transitioning into more of a mainstream product offering, higher visibility, better advertising, carrier deals, carrier partnerships. That's gonna come with some pros and cons. You know, more folks are gonna be able to pick up on the phones. It's not gonna be the same plucky, nimble company that it was, you know, in the OnePlus 3 days. You know, OnePlus 3 to OnePlus 3T, that was an exciting and dynamic and interesting change as the company started to grow up. It was getting rid of the lottery system for buying the phones. It was becoming a, a, a core competitor against $600 Samsungs. Um, it can't stay there. It needs to change over time. I would highly recommend watching that video from Tech Alter. It is, it, it is, it is one of the best pieces of tech commentary that has ever been produced on the situation as we find ourselves in the modern age of tech fandom. So, um, oh, I gotta kind of, ah, kind of crack my back there. Whew. So, OnePlus 7T, OnePlus 7T Pro, these were not inexpensive phones. I, I, I feel it's, it's, um, it's a conversation in bad faith. If you're prejudging OnePlus, I, I'm actually fairly confident that these are accurate prices, that pricing on, on these phones will be climbing higher. If you gave me the exact same phone as the OnePlus 7T and all you did, was swap out the Snapdragon 855 Plus for a Snapdragon 865, 
I would expect a component pricing difference of at least $75. <laughs> I mean, by the time you actually factor in licensing costs and all the software that goes into that, you have to, you have to play ball with Qualcomm setup, and then you have to make money on that. I would expect just on its own, a $70, a $75 price bump this year, just because of what Qualcomm is doing with 5G. That's on Qualcomm. And every single manufacturer has hit some kind of pricing bump because of the Snapdragon 865. It's why we have a base model Galaxy S20 at $999. But again, Samsung and Apple are premium brands, so it's okay if we lobster pot there. Oh, we're gonna complain about phone prices getting higher but we're just gonna take that as part of the for granted conversation. And that's never gonna be a deal breaker for Samsung fans, you see. But on a OnePlus, that's a betrayal. How could they betray their core audience like that? So again, I don't feel like this is a conversation being held in earnest or a conversation being held fairly. This is the clickbaitiness of trying to jack up some type of Phone rage porn? I don't I don't know what we call this. So well, then again, every manufacturer except LG. But remember, LG made compromises. <gasps> oh man. LG whittled back a few specs, but kept a bunch of their core functionality, and now they're charging less for the V60 than they did for the V50. Can't handle compromises. Oof. I mean, you spend less. It's $200 difference over a V60 compared to a Galaxy S20, but you, you, Samsung's you should pay more for. <laughs> ah. So, um, yes, I am anxious over the OnePlus 8, but what I am not anxious about is a strategy where OnePlus is making a pivot and they're doing all of the things that people have criticized OnePlus for not including. The OnePlus 8 is going to carry a proper IP certification. Um, that makes the OnePlus brand more viable in countries like Japan. The Japanese were way ahead of us on trying to bolster consumer tech adoption with things like water resistance. If you remember, there were even some funky one-off phones that would only go to Japan so that they could be properly IP certified for the Japanese market. That's where a company grows. OnePlus becomes a more viable global brand when they make a pivot like that. Properly certifying that IP rating costs money. You got to send the phones to an organization and a board that are going to rate the phone. They're going to smash a bunch of phones, <laughs> destroy a bunch of phones that you send them to properly guarantee that the phone is rated appropriately. That's the cost of doing business. And those costs trickle down to consumers. A lot of people were critical over the OnePlus 7s not having wireless charging. I actually think more folks should be walking away from wireless charging. I think wireless charging is less convenient. It causes the phone to heat the battery up to a higher temperature than charging over a cable. Wireless reverse charging is a horrible uh, solution for charging other accessories on the go at the expense of your phone's battery life health. But if it's a convenient add-on or accessory that folks care about, that was a, a con on the OnePlus 7s. So they're going to include coils on the OnePlus 8. That's an extra feature. One, wireless charging coils are cheap, but that's still something to add and put in the box. And it's a OnePlus, which means you have proprietary charging technologies that need to be built and paid for through research and development. And those R&D costs get lumped into the phone. From a OnePlus 7 to a OnePlus 8, we see water resistance, wireless charging, a different selfie camera design, so it's a hole punch on that AMOLED display, 
we're still rocking 90 hertz refresh rates, which means you have to have a premium OLED. It can't be any like P OLED or regular OLED. And what, what did I just miss? Larger batteries over the OnePlus 7s and the Snapdragon 865. And we're gonna be what? Roughly $150 difference? That kind of makes sense. Is it a bummer that OnePluses are going to cost more and that OnePlus isn't making the exact same argument for price performance versus an iPhone 11? It is a bit of a bummer. I think everyone would agree that we need more competition in the $400 to $700 territory. But I don't see anything here that flies in the face of the OnePlus philosophy and is an appropriate price performance bump for the extra features and stuff that we're gonna be getting. So I, I am really anxious about the response. I feel like the popularity commentary is going to forgive Samsung a bunch of price increases because it's popular and it does well for SEO. And there are always gonna be more people searching for Samsung on YouTube than any other brand. But just like with the OnePlus 7, uh, especially the OnePlus 7 Pro, it's going to be frustrating because we should be looking at different combinations of features at different price tiers, not OnePlus used to cost $400, it should always cost $400, used to be a cheap phone, now it's not a cheap phone, is the worst. That's horrible, toxic commentary that doesn't contribute to a nuanced tech discussion. It doesn't help people find the right product for them. And it means that you can't ever accept if a brand changes over time or grows to meet the demands of a larger audience. That's not competition. The only thing we should care about, I mean, outside of what we personally use, is better competition. Because if you want your product and your favorite brand to get better, it's only going to get better when that brand faces better competition. That's the game. So, um, Goran Petrovic, I can't wait for the Xperia 1 reviews this year. We'll probably be disappointed, but still the most complete 2020 phone so far. The, the Xperia 1 Mark II looks like it's going to be amazing. But it looks like it's going to be amazing at 1,400 euro. And if that's not a compromise, a price $600 higher than a V60, that has to be a part of the conversation. I am irrationally excited to see a refresh of the Xperia 1. And an Xperia 1 versus LG V60 is maybe my most exciting phone fight of the year. But it's a phone fight with a $600 difference <laughs> between the two. Gabaletta, if anything, blame Qualcomm for higher pricing because of the new chipset needing a separate module for 5G. Completely agree there. Um, uh, Matt Tyler, considering a phone with the same specs and very similar hardware costs $1,200, the OnePlus pricing makes sense. And actually that's kind of a fair, um, we don't have exact pricing for all regions. And there are some things that could totally change, but I mean, like you could go to GSM arena while well, I was pulling up notes for the show, looking at the OnePlus 8 Pro versus the OnePlus 8. So let's look at the OnePlus 8 Pro knowing that the top of the line OnePlus 8 Pro is going to cost $1,000, roughly, or let's say 1,000 euro. It's going to roughly cost 1,000 euro. Uh, they're going Gorilla Glass 6 on the front, Gorilla Glass 5 on the back with IP68 water resistance. It's got the Quad HD 19.5 um, by 9 aspect ratio display. So that's 3120 by 1440 with up to a 120 hertz refresh rate. These are rumors, but they sound reasonable to me. Um, 256 gigabytes of storage, 12 gigabytes of RAM, UFS 3.0 storage, so it's more expensive. The one really interesting thing for me is the rumored camera module. So they're sticking with a 48 megapixel sensor, but this is a different 48 megapixel sensor than what's on the OnePlus 7 and is larger. So this is gonna be an even bigger 48 megapixel sensor. That means the photo sites, when you, when you pixel bin on this sensor to get a 12 megapixel image, the overall photo sites on the, uh, the OnePlus 8 Pro are going to be enormous. 
So this, this, I mean, over galaxies and over my V60, OnePlus has always had issues with their camera software, but their camera hardware has always been bulletproof. And this could be another incredible low light performer for using an even bigger 48 megapixel camera sensor. Again, they're gonna see, oh, that it has the 48 megapixels and a Samsung has the 64 megapixels. Not the same, not the same, not comparable. Different technologies, different resolu uh, different pixel and photo site sizes. Um, let's see, they're, they're gonna stick with stereo speakers, no headphone jack, 16 megapixel uh, selfie camera, which I think is similar to the one that's on the OnePlus 7. And then we're gonna be adding 5G connectivity. It's a USB 3.1 Type-C uh, cable, where is it? Oh, and the battery is a 4,500 milliamp hour battery with uh, fast charging, 30 watt wireless charging. And they're rumoring that it's gonna have reverse wireless charging, which people should never use. Seriously, just keep a USB cable on hand and charge your accessories off of a USB cable and it's so much more efficient than reverse wireless charging, but it'll have it because apparently that's something that we need. So you take all the Oppo parts from BBK, you staple them together. And this to me looks like it's a perfectly competitive Galaxy S20 competitor with some pros and some cons over a Galaxy S20. I'm, I'm not seeing where this, this price performance ratio is out of line with the rest of the smartphone market. This This looks like it's, it's appropriate. Ah, <laughs> uh, so bur burn, so burn to notice, burn totus. I don't know how you're supposed to say your name. I'm gonna start calling you Burn Notice because I like the show. Um, Tech Alter mentioned that the one that OnePlus is owned by Oppo and their flagship features are similar to OnePlus like Superbook. Uh, OnePlus is not owned by Oppo. OnePlus and Oppo are owned by the same. Uh, umbrella corporation. And so Oppo is sort of the larger international brand. Whatever Oppo develops or whatever they develop for Oppo becomes a part of the parts bin that all the other companies can kind of draw from. We saw this specifically with the OnePlus 5, where the OnePlus 5 uh, borrowed very heavily from Oppo's strategy that year. And then from there on, whatever's sort of top of the line or in vogue at Oppo becomes the platform that we see for OnePlus. Makes a lot of sense. You save development costs, you save money. It's kind of like when you build one drivetrain for a car and then it goes to a bunch of different vehicle manufacturers like the Audi group, VW. You know, they make one little platform and then it goes to six other manufacturers. That's a way that you save money. So, um so yeah, uh, that's the one plus eight. What are I, I'm? What are we thinking that the over under is going to be? Uh, if United States pricing, one plus eight pro. I'm assuming that we're going to see a one plus eight pro top of the line, twelve gigs of RAM, uh, two hundred fifty six gigabytes of storage. That they're going to price it nine ninety nine for the United States. What do we think? Um, what do, what do we think the top of the line OnePlus Pro pricing is gonna be for different regions. They're saying, the leak is saying, especially in Eastern Europe, 1,009 euro for that top of the line. Um, <laughs> Mr. Penriquez, oh, oh, they're owned by Umbrella Corporation? <laughs> Dave Burns, I don't wanna range. Don't give me a range. What do you, no, I'm putting you on the spot. You are going to push by on a OnePlus Pro tomorrow, top of the line. What what dollar amount do you see in your shopping cart? I'm saying 9.99, that's my guess. Uh, from Rue Sunshine, 8.99 for the top of the line non-pro. And I think that's probably gonna hold true about a hundred dollar or a hundred euro difference for each step. So you've got the OnePlus 8, eight gig, 128 gigabytes of storage, and then the 256 gigabytes of storage. And then you've got the eight pro, eight gigabytes of RAM, 12 gigabytes of RAM, 128 gigabytes of storage, 256 gigabyte, gigabytes of storage. But I think for the for the US, I think they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna hard cap it $1,000 just to say our top of the line phone 
costs the same as the base model Samsung. That's that's my the psychological trick. OnePlus eight, the OnePlus isn't a isn't a budget brand anymore, and then they can go out and say, our top of the line phone costs the same as Samsung's base model phone, and that I think is is a good psychological hook for OnePlus. Uh, let's see, Gabaletta is saying ten ninety nine, so one thousand ninety nine. Dave Burns is also saying eleven hundred. Um, Matt Tyler's, the leaks are saying that the UK has the pro, the top of the line pro at 899 euro, or is that the, the lower end eight pro at 899, um, or sorry, 899 pounds. Um, uh, Root Knight is saying he would shoot for 1100 euro for the top model. Um, Simon says Hypno going with some different numbers here. Simon says Hypno is saying 949 for the top model, 879 for the lower end. Interesting. Okay. Okay. All right. I like that. You know, trying to undercut Samsung. I, I could see that. Charlie Spirit Song is backing you up saying $950 for the top of the line. Um, but Goran Petrovic, no wonder LG is aiming for a $700 Snapdragon 765 phone when the uh, 865s are priced as they are. Uh, problem for LG is that the V60 exists. <laughs> but the V60 here in the United States is 800. The, uh, this, this with the case is a $900 phone. So with two screens, a V60, oh, I don't have my dual screen on. Hold on, let me turn on my dual screen. So at, at, at 899, not at 999, $899, this phone has two displays opposite a OnePlus 8 Pro, which will only have one display at 800. I think it's a totally fair competitive comparison. Do you want one higher resolution, more fluid display, or do you want two displays for way more multitasking, better control over typing, playing games. And we have different pros and cons. You know, the 64 megapixel sensor versus this new 48 megapixel sensor, a headphone jack, which is absolutely stunning and amazing versus having to spend more for Bluetooth earbuds if you're on a OnePlus 8 Pro. There, there's, oh, and digitizer support. So now your your V60 can also use a pen, an active pen, which it's 50 bucks to get a good, you know, digitizer stylus, but you can do it. Whereas a OnePlus won't be able to do anything like that. So this is fitting all these pieces together, man. This 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 stuff is is what competition should really look like. It's not we made the exact same phone as Apple and we charged $20 less. That's not competition. Competition is offering real differences and there will be pros and cons, you know, features and compromises, but then offering different, um, uh, offering different prices for where those different features fit. From Matt Tyler, just imagine a world where OnePlus uh, can sell a top end eight pro for 7.99 and shocks the world one can dream. I wouldn't put it outside the realm of possibility though. I don't, I really don't believe that the OnePlus 8 Pro top of the line phone is gonna hit $800. But OnePlus has always had fun leaking out higher prices. And then when you get to the press conference, their prices aren't bargain prices anymore, but they undercut all of the leaks. Remember, we went through this with the OnePlus 7 Pro. We were all assuming the OnePlus 7, 8, uh, OnePlus 7 Pro was gonna be an $800, $900 phone. And then they came out at a much lower price point than the leaks put out. I wouldn't be surprised if we see uh, a leak for Eastern Europe that this phone is gonna cost 1,009 euro. And then when it comes out, it's like 949. <laughs> you know, like it's not even huge. It's just, it's just under what the leak was. And then the psychology of that, oh, oh, thank goodness. It's not over a thousand euro. 
but it's like 50 bucks. You know? <laughs> Uh, and then, oh, and, and, and Zach too brings up a good point. Uh, if there's a OnePlus Z or a OnePlus 8 Lite or some lower end model, if we could hit 599, if we could hit somewhere in that $600 territory, that would be a phenomenal competitive phone. I mean, just think about having like an LG Velvet and a OnePlus 8 Lite at a carrier store, 599. And you walk in and they're baller, slick, pretty phones, all of the flagship features that most consumers really need, performance that's in line with Snapdragon 845s, that's clean. I would love to see uh, LG and OnePlus duking it out between five and $600. Absolutely awesome, just great. Good, 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 good. So um, I'm gonna try and, and live tweet. Um, I'm debating whether or not I just wanna hang out in my own Discord. Uh, the Patreon, patreon.com slash some gadget guy has their own private Discord. But I think I'm gonna take it out to Twitter. Uh, I'm sure folks are gonna be joining. Uh, the OnePlus announcement is tomorrow. So we'll, we'll stream and we'll watch it all together and we'll gnash our teeth at the rumors and the leaks and what the pricing will eventually be. So that should be fun. Um, hopefully you can all join us for that. If you can catch me on some gadget guy uh, on Twitter at some gadget guy on Twitter, and we'll, we'll have a good conversation all together. Excuse me. Um, oh, and, and burn to Otis is saying, you're right. It's burn notice. Okay. I'm just going to call you burn notice then. I'm, I'm glad. It's a, that's a show I need to go back and binge. I loved burn notice. Uh, just such good times. Uh, a, a, a hearty recommend if you haven't read um, If Chins Could Kill. Uh, it's a, a, a great autobiography uh, from uh, one of my favorite actors. So um, I want to wrap up the show. A couple quick freebies. Uh, every week I've been trying to share some things that I find around the internet. Like I said, we're probably burning through our normal comfort shows and media. Maybe we're replaying games. There's some great things out there that we can take advantage of. Huge shout out. Um, one of my all time favorite bands, I, I think doing an amazing job rising to the occasion. Uh, this this is just a, a really nice consideration. Uh, Radiohead is gonna start delivering their concerts for free. And so the first one that, they, uh, that they've put out on YouTube is Radiohead live from a tent in Dublin. And this was a performance back in October of 2000. Hashtag stay home, hashtag with me. They're going to be doing this with more concerts. Stay tuned to the Radiohead YouTube channel. But this is this is a, a lovely, a wonderful consideration from an incredible um, group of performers. And, and I hope to see more, more things like this. Y you want some noise on in the background. You want some like low level distraction. A concert is just so accessible for something like that. And and I just, I already, I love this group. Um, I don't own a lot of vinyl. A good chunk of my vinyl collection is Radiohead just cause I, I, I love them so much. <laughs> I mean, you'll see Tool and, you know, hip hop and classic hip hop and R&B and mashups and stuff in my audio reviews. This has completely encouraged me to like go back to the entire Radiohead catalog just cause it's such, such a wonderful um, sentiment and such a, such a nice consideration for their fans. Um, oh, and, and yes, I'm sorry, I completely forgot about this. Simon Says Hypno and Gabaletta, uh, Metallica is doing the same, uh, that if you dig on Metallica, they're gonna be putting out some of their concerts too. Uh, this next freebie is uh, really heady. This is, this is a, a mind trip of a website. This is coming by way of Andrew Wallace, Everyone Tell Fat Produce, Big thumbs up. This was a good find. Um, this website is called ApolloInRealTime.org. Um, so they are. This is a this is a uh, a website that's taking all of the Mission Control film footage, the onboard TV and film footage, Mission Control audio, over seventy two hundred hours of Mission Control audio and all of the onboard recordings, press photos, transcripts, and the post-mission commentary. 
and you can follow the Apollo 13 mission in real time. So there, on, you're gonna go to the site and you're gonna see two buttons. You can join a launch already in progress. So right now it would be the equivalent of when we were uh, at April 13th of 1970, or you can start a new launch. So you click on T minus one minute and it counts it down just like the launch did leading up to Apollo 13. And then you can follow the entire Apollo 13 mission in real time. That is so rad. <laughs> I'm like, I want to set up like a tablet and just have it off on the side and let that do the entire Apollo 13 mission. And I think I'm going to run that um, t starting tomorrow. I think I'm just going to have it on and check it out. And then uh, uh, one last, it's not a freebie. Um, it's one that you might be able to take advantage of if you're already uh, using a bunch of streaming services, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon. We talked about, a couple weeks back, we talked about Netflix uh, watch parties. We've I, I've been curious, Amazon owns Twitch. Why not enable some similar functionality for Twitch? Well, they've been rolling out Twitch watch parties and it's starting to hit a broader community of streamers. And so this is coming by a, a tweet from Travis Schreffler. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Twitch is testing out watch parties, allow streamers to stream Amazon Prime video content that will be viewable only to viewers who have Amazon Prime. So you're a Twitch streamer, you've got an audience of Twitch viewers. You, if you're all using Amazon Prime, you can stream a movie together. So they can watch the movie along with you in real time. You'll have one feed for the chat and it's a nice social experiment. Um, I, I got one Netflix watch party up off the ground. It didn't work as well as I had hoped it would, more because of the people involved. Uh, just I had a couple friends and like, I was like kind of trying to lead a chat with people who don't really participate in live chats. So now I really want to try and do something similar. But again, don't discount some of the tools at your disposal. Um, on on the Patreon, on the Patreon, we have a private Discord a few more, you know, group calls just so we can hang out and talk to each other. Uh, we've been chatting a lot just in text. I, I want to set up a, a movie night where we can all watch the same movie together and we can use some, a service like Discord to make sure we're all talking and MST3King it together. So um, better tools like this is just going to help the idea expand. So I'm, I'm very positive Amazon is leveraging one of the best platforms for this type of community conversation. If you have access to it, go check it out. Twitch watch parties. It, it, when I have access to them, I might try one too. So, um, uh, so yeah, so those are the freebies for the week. As always, if you find something that's cool, that's free, you can take advantage of, uh, share it. Try and spread the word. Hit me up. Hey, I just found this cool thing. People might like it. It's free. I'll, I'll, I'll try and signal boost some tweets like that because I think we all need fresh entertainment, new uh, engagement, new things to check out. And it can't always just be like, well, I rented this movie or I bought this thing or I'm playing this new game that was $80 or something like that. Free games, free music, free movies and free collaboration tools so that we can share our experiences. It's gonna help us feel a bit more connected to all of our friends out there. So folks, I've gone crazy long. Gonna wrap this up. Uh, as always, thank you so much for an amazing live chat. I, I, I Just tracking this conversation, all of the folks in this in this live chat, I, this, this fills me with energy for the week and I can't thank you enough. Words are incomplete or, or insufficient to tell you how much I care about having these streams every Monday morning with you. I want you to have a fantastic week with your technology. I want you to do awesome with your technology. I want you to be awesome with your technology. Stay healthy. Keep your heads down. Wash your hands. It's getting crazy out there, but we're, we're, we're starting to see the potential for our light at the end of the tunnel. Now's the time that we really got to stick to it. It's the marathon. We're going to finish this marathon together. And I know I've got a great group of people out there that are going to help their family and friends and be good tech neighbors, 
good tech citizens. Folks, I'm going to catch you back here next week for another episode of the Monday Morning Tech Chat Show on the SGGQA channel. Take care. Be safe. I love you all. I'll catch you back.